All right, it is nine o'clock and I'm gonna go ahead and get started. Are we good up in the booth up there? Fantastic, well, good morning, everybody. I'm just so excited to be here today along with my amazing seniors who are finally getting to this place of almost finishing their mechanical engineering degrees. Can we give them a round of applause? This morning we have 10 groups um, that will be presenting their final presentation and then also we'll be going back to the atrium to set up and then show off so most of their almost finalized products. They are probably about 80 to 90 percent finished. Um, but I just wanted to introduce myself. My name is uh, Dr. Jamie Gerganes. I am the senior capstone professor for the mechanical engineering department. I am faculty also in our engineering and computing education program. Uh, so this is something that I absolutely adore and value, seeing the students be able to actually utilize their engineering skills, professional practices and abilities, and to really put it into uh, practice. Uh, I just cannot say enough how hard and how challenging these 15 weeks are for them because they are given a authentic problem to be able to solve and also do it for a client. And today we do have many of our clients here today as well as maybe online. So I want to say hello to all of you and thank you very much for spending your time and dedication and even resources to allow them to be able to put all this into per practice. Uh, I just wanted to spend the first uh, about five minutes giving an introduction to this. So today we will have our, our students come and do their final presentations. They will spend about eight minutes. They have about eight minutes to present their final, their entire product life cycle from beginning to end, and also where they're going to be in the next couple of weeks. Uh, in fact, afterwards, they will be demoing with their clients and me to see their actual verification and validation of their product, which is super exciting. Uh, so I do ask that you understand that they will have eight minutes and uh, that afterwards then our lovely professional judges down here from American Society of Mechanical Engineers, can we give them a round of applause for being here today? <laughs> also representing various different companies and areas around the state of Maryland uh, from federal to, uh, to uh, private sector as well. So they are wonderful people and they all said that they're going to give you jobs afterwards that's what i heard is that correct yeah right logan yeah <laughs> I also have to also say that we have amazing alumni here from our clients that are shown here as well, that are representing as well on our judging panel. So it's really nice to have them back because they just love it so much. So are you all ready? You feel energized? You're gonna crash later on. Yeah, have it made you work enough? I was also wanted to give a little special thank you to my lovely teaching assistant, Emily. Say hi, thank you. <laughs> as well as our teaching fellow, uh, what's your name? Oh, Alex, <laughs> who actually will also be graduating this semester. But Emily will be getting starting her PhD soon, now here at UBC. Finally, she got accepted. Let's give her a round of applause for that. <laughs> All right, and also I, I please uh, give a round of applause for Mr. Hank Mink, who really helped a lot of you with your machining and other resources and valuable time, please. I know he's not here, but if he is online. Okay, well, it is 9.03. Why not we start, or 9.04? What? Yeah, why don't we, you want me to keep talking? I don't think people want to keep, do you want me to sing for you? Yeah, no. <laughs> All right, well, let me walk over and see if our group back here is ready. You all ready? Ready to start early? Why don't you come out here? So this group, to start off with, uh, they, will, uh, they will introduce themselves. But to begin, these are our attendance collector group. So thank you for being here. And I'm gonna, oh, you have your mic? Yeah. OK, got your mics. All right, I will bring this down to our judges. Actually, and you got the other one. All right. Emily, you let them know when they can begin. Oh, we're good. Good morning, everyone. My name is Courtney Jones. I'm Justin Bunkley. And I'm Zach Deal. And my name is Toby Magic Odumi. 
And this, we are the come to class attendance box collector. So to start off with our background, our client is Professor Sean Lupoli, and he is a UMBC uh, computer science professor, specifically an introductory computer science professor. And his problem is that he has classes of up to 200 to 300 students, and he wants to track student attendance, but the current systems for UMBC re don't require that students are in person to track their attendance. They can do it from their bedroom or anywhere. They, uh, as long as they have the code. So what he wants to do is, excuse me, he, uh, and attendance is directly correlated to uh, student performance, especially in those introductory level cl classes. So the solution that Professor Lup Lupoli proposed is that he would have an in-person device that requires students to scan their barcodes and then submit their attendance that way. So the specific requirements of our system are one, that it is scanning the barcodes, scanning UMBC student ID barcodes, and then converting that data into something useful, a CSV file, which then electronically goes to Professor Lupoli. And the, two, the next part of our system is that it provides feedback. First most to the students, being feedback that lets them know that their, their cards were actually scanned correctly. And then feedback to Professor Lupoli, which, lets, which give him, gives him the report of student absences. And then the other parts of our system are that it is maintaining a temperature under 60 degrees Celsius because there are electronics that are outputting heat and that our system has a 12 hour battery life because that is the expected duration of use for two weeks. All right, so as to get into the, disease, the, the details of our design, um, we broke this down into three major parts. So we have a physical, part, which is the box itself. We have the, uh, what you would call your front end code, which is everything that takes the barcode and everything off the student ID. And then you have your back end code that creates the attendance report. So as for our design iterations, uh, first off, we wanted to do an aluminum body. Found out that was going to be really hard to manufacture and expensive. So we went with a UHMW plastic. Uh, the scanner, we initially wanted to use the mag swipe feature of a student ID card. However, due to security requirements at UMBC, that wasn't allowed. So we ordered a barcode scanner that actually didn't end up working. So we ended up having to find yet another scanner that was able to do everything that we wanted to. Um, originally, Professor Lupoli wanted it to be that there was an email report with all of the attendance data from each given week. Um, however, due to our time constraint, we had to transition the strategy into being more focused around the uh, output of a report. So the physical box itself is a two-part design made, like I said, of that UHMW plastic. It's lockable and it's cooled with two 40 millimeter fans. And this is the CAD model of it. Uh, the bracket itself is 3D printed, whereas the rest of the box is uh, heated up and bent from a sheet of plastic. So the Arduino process allows for visual confirmation when a student is successfully recorded their attendance. Uh, that data from their library ID is then sent to the Arduino and associated with a time that is then packaged into a CSV file and sent into a form that the Python script can read. That Python script has the whole CSV with everything from the Arduino as well as the course roster. Then that uh, information is cross-referenced and a report is sent out about uh, who is there and who isn't there. All right, and now I'm going to talk a little bit about the fabrication and testing for the attendance box. So as Zach mentioned, our part was 3D design, and so what you see on the screen is a 3D sketch of the box attendance laid out. And so to fabricate and physically design the box, we heated up the, or excuse me, first we laser cut it out, the UHMW plastic, and then we heated it up so that we could bend the plastic into the desired shape that we had. And then lastly, as mentioned, the 3D bracket, or excuse me, the bracket was 3D printed for, in order to hold the electronics. And so what you see on the screen now is currently 
the state or the final design of the fabricated box. So as you can see, the two parts that were heated up are currently seen where the door is attached by a hinge and then the main box itself. And so the next stage of testing for our attendance box is to number one, confirm that our, our device specifically, the Arduino can connect to UMBC Wi-Fi. And then after a period of time of non-use non will transition into sleep mode. Provided, uh, in addition to that, the addition of batteries to power the system, uh, test for temperature sensing, and lastly demonstrate via a class to show that our attendance box is able to handle a large class size. And so testing that's already been done on our box is for the Python which I will be talking about next, where it is able to completely compile an entire class roster into a single uh, CSV Excel file. And so what you see on the screen here is a quick sample of it. So A is your like your sample guest roster, at, or excuse me, student roster. And then it transitions to B, where after each scan, each scan is turned into its own CSV file. And then lastly, after running all of the Arduino and Python, it is then converted into a single Excel file, which is what you see at C. And so for future testing, we need to test for the heat loading inside of the box, scanning and transmission, and lastly, perform a demo at ENES 101 final. All right, so I'm gonna talk about the timeline real quick. Um, this, we have our proposed and actual timeline. Our proposed timeline is taken directly from our Gantt chart. Um, so February, we started out pretty well. We were developing an understanding of the project background and creating an initial design concept. March, we completed our prototypes and we met with experts, and by experts we mean Dr. LaBerge and some other people who know more about computer engineering than we do. Um, and then we developed our early sketches and CAD models and we started ordering our supplies. By April, things had gone off the rails a bit. We were about a month behind. Um, we had completed our CAD models, but we were starting to synthesize our feedback to plan the design process and we started our code for Python processing. But we were supposed to be closer to testing and construction by this point. That actually didn't happen until May. Um, where we started to make our final design changes. We were still ordering stuff and we were finalizing the program. Um, this is a little bit slower, but we are getting the project done. It is in a good place now. Um, on May 19th, that's our product demo with ENES 101. May 23rd is when we have our final report to do, and May 25th, we graduate. Um, in the future, we'd like to establish a Bluetooth connection in order to send the SD card data to the host computer. That would be that CSV file that Justin had mentioned. Um, the real-time clock module in order to have the Arduino with an actual, like, clock that's not dependent on Wi-Fi or anything else. Uh, we'd like to include solar power and battery um, rather than um, a more wasteful form of battery to, in to increase sustainability, have a better user interface, and get access to that do it information at some point. Thank you very much. Are there any questions? Great. Um, I appreciate the uh, presentation. It was very thorough. It looks like a good job. Um, I do have a quick question associated with the requirements. Uh, there, were, there were a couple of statements you mentioned. Power budget was one that came to mind. You said it had to last for 12 hours. Maybe you could elaborate on that. And then secondly, they're both kind of interrelated, but like an FEA of the structure that you created, it, was there any structural concerns or did you do, do any FEA to understand what sort of factor of safety you might have? What kind of, you know, would it, ha would it have to survive a drop on the ground or something like that? And then the thermal aspects of things. You had a fan, was there any sort of uh, theory behind how you came up with that or any sort of analysis? Yeah, so I can start out by addressing the power budget uh, side of it. So that 12 hour number is with the association that it's gonna be able to um, stay in the classroom uh, for, it's gonna be able to continuously run for 12 hours. Um, there's gonna be a low power state to save battery. Um, so that 12 hours is continuous run time, um, which should give us what we approximate to be about a week of attendance collection within a classroom. Meet this goal. I, I don't 
Yes, that is that is the goal. That it will be able to continuously supply power for 12 hours without a low power mode. How much power they draw and compare that to the model? Yes. And then Toby can talk about the um, FEA and the heat transfer stuff. Yeah, I'll just touch on the heat transfer stuff briefly. Uh, so we did... Uh, basically the fans have what is called a cubic feet per minute that they can push out uh, for airflow to cool uh, a box or cool really an area of space. So we did the calculations to compare that cubic feet per minute to the expected power output of our system. And although we couldn't necessarily get the direct parameters of the expected, you know, uh, inefficiencies of our system and the heat that it would output, we based it off of, we assumed the worst that the systems would be extremely inefficient and majority of the heat or majority of the power that was going in would be reconverted to heat. And then we based that off of the cubic feet per minute that the airflow would be pushing out and the fans were able to keep it at an adequate temperature under that 60 degrees Celsius. And then Just a, a quick question uh, about economics. Uh, twofold, how did your project go on what you had to spend? And do you have estimates of the cost of your device? Yeah, so with the, we were slightly over our budget of $200. Um, I think that everything compiled, we were at, we're at approximately $210. Um, so we were able to keep it fairly close. Uh, when you're dealing with electronic components, uh, it's difficult to stay within that bound. Um, our Arduino was a quarter of our operating budget, so um, we were able to keep it within a within a pretty good margin of our estimated budget. All right, one more real quick. Um, why did you guys choose to 3D print the bracket and then? just out of all the components, like you didn't 3D print the box or anything, just the bracket, typically you're not gonna 3D print structural components like that? Yeah, so the reason that we chose to do a 3D printed bracket is just because one, the we know that since the electronics do generate some heat, we wanted a material that would be able to withstand and support that heat without like melting the structure itself while still being structurally, in tech, stru being structurally sound and maintain its integrity and based on our research we found that 3D printing would be the best method to go about that. Why would you not just use a metal bracket? So the issue and concern that we have with the metal bracket because we did also consider looking at metal components is that when dealing with electronics you then need to get into matters of like insulation because then there's a concern of like electrocution from not only like user interface of like when people go to repair the device but also just like in general of the system itself. All right, and uh, Prof. Lupoli's online. He said, thank you very much. He did ask about the solar battery, so maybe you want to just address that uh, really quick. I'll let him ask a question, and then we have to. So the solar battery was a suggestion that we got during our PDR. Um, we, it would be kind of like a calculator. You know how calculators have the little solar batteries? Since it would be in a classroom anyway that typically has like pretty much constant fluorescent lighting. That was the thought process behind that. It's not something that we think we can achieve now, but in terms of a future suggestion, so future recommendations. yeah, um, we just think it would be a way to kind of increase the efficiency and lessen the environmental uh, harm com caused by our Wonderful. project. Congratulations on your last final presentation. They are all graduating, so <laughs> give them a round of applause. All right, our next team, the Dynamometer Group. Yeah, I think they'll see you better there. What? Was it? what? Uh, we'll then move to the side. Oh, and by the way, it'd be great. One thing I did notice online is uh, that you're standing in front of your PowerPoint, so maybe kind of stand a little bit here or like over there, but that way they see you. Okay? All right. All right, uh, good morning everyone, and welcome to the CVT Dynamometer final presentation. We're team 18, my name is Alec Atwell. I'm Chris Bryan. 
and my name is Eric Puckett. So, oop, it double clicked. Come on up. There we go. All right, so uh, the goal of our project is to deliver the first iteration of an off the car CVT RPM testing device for UMBC Racing. There's a racing team on campus here that participates in the SAE Baja Race Series. This was commissioned by an alumni of the team, Eugene Morganov, a current member of the Baltimore Society of Automotive Engineers. All right, and here are some of our key system requirements. So the team wanted the dyno to accommodate the Kohler CH44 engine, uh, CH440 engine, engine, which is the standard engine used in competitions. Uh, uh, the team wanted the dyno to export the collected data at a fast refresh rate, as the current tool uh, collects data at a very slow rate. Uh, it should have a hazardous release of energy guarding, which is in compliance with SAA rules and ensures the safety of the user. And most importantly, it should disregard the sensor noise generated by the engine, as sensor noise can lead to in inaccurate data, which can result in incorrect decisions and uh, conclusions and decisions from the team. And also, an important thing they wanted was an adjustable center to center distance, which, as this will allow for as this will allow them to test a wide range of CVT configurations. So currently our final design consists of the following. It consists of the frame and guarding and the data acquisition unit. So firstly with the frame, it consists of A500 steel and the guarding consists of 063-4130 for the radial guarding in compliance with the SAE rules. Finally, the frame has an adjustable center to center distance which is required by the user. And finally, we incorporated rubber washers in order to dampen the vibrations caused by the engine. For the data acquisition unit, this consists of Hall effect sensors, an Arduino microcontroller, and, the Arduino, and using software like Arduino IDE, Python, and Excel, we are able to interpret and analyze the data that we collect. So uh, the design has gone through a few iterations throughout um, our process this semester. Uh, you see sort of our first um, full model on the left there. This was um, our prototype one. Um, it was mainly focused on just packaging everything where we wanted it and less so on ease of assembly or manufacturability. So uh, it's gone through some changes in order to make that easier. We've put cutouts on the tubes to make installing the engine and secondary mounts easier. Um, we've uh, removed certain tubes that uh, made it hard to install a CVT belt and we've switched to custom um, bearing blocks in order to save on costs. You can see our final CAD model here shows all that as well as we've added um, plexiglass finger protection up front. So continuing on with our current testing and analysis, initially we've done collection rate testing and this consisted of using a drill, the Arduino, the breadboard, various wiring and just a laptop. And the reason we use the drill is due to various uh, safety concerns. So um, continuing on as you can see, on the picture, uh, the picture to the left, you can see this is just a general testing setup. And on the picture to the right, you can see our collected data. Currently, our data is collected at a, uh, a data point every quarter second, so about four data points per second, which is to our spec. Continuing on, we did a finite element analysis on the secondary shaft. And this consisted of a 200, pound, a 200 pound force lateral load simulating the belt tension that's going to be seen by the CVT belt. And this yielded a max strength of approximately 28,500 PSI. And knowing that the yield strength of uh, normalized 4130 is around 67,000 PSI, this gives us a factor of safety of 2.3. All right, and this is an FEA of our custom bearing block. So the block would experience, will experience a lateral, lateral load of 200 pound force, and which would put it under maximum strength of uh, maximum stress of 296 psi. And knowing that the yield strength of 60, 6061 T6 is about 40,000 psi, would uh, would suggest a factor of safety of about 134. There's a delay in that. Yeah. All right, and here is an uh, FEF of, uh, of, of our radial guarding. So we simulated, we simulated uh, 
we simulated a, a scenario in which a 160 gram weight hits impacts the guarding at a speed of about 30 foot per second, and this resulted in the loading in the loading force of 3.3 pound force, uh, which makes which puts the radial, which puts the guarding under a max stress of about 1089 psi, and knowing the yield strength of 41 third normalized, uh, this would suggest a factor of safety of 61. All right, so continuing on with the future fabrication and testing plan of our device, we first plan on finalizing and testing the second prototype of the dynamometer, and then we're going to revise the second proto prototype in accordance with our testing results. Continuing on, finally, we're going, to test, we're going to implement these results into the final prototype, test and evaluate this final prototype, and then manufacture and test the final design. So, our, testing will, our future testing will consist of the following. It will consist of an accuracy test, a collection rate test, and a safety test. So first, for the accuracy test, we're just going to, by comparing through our mini tachometer that we currently have in the Baja shop, and also by comparing to other resources from other teams that have done similar products, we're going to compare our data to those products to ensure that our data that we're collecting is accurate. Continuing on with the collection rate test, we are going to take multiple trials with the data acquisition system to measure the RPM to ensure that there is consistency within the results and to ensure that we are getting enough data in order to accurately analyze the data that we are receiving. Finally, we're going to revalidate our safety test uh, of the radial impact guarding, and this is due to the fact that 3.3 pound force on the radial guarding seems pretty low, and we have a uh, guess that it might be due to the impact time that we assumed for this. Um, so we're going to reevaluate that to ensure that the results we are getting, we are, getting are uh, legitimate. All right, so here's our bill of materials. Um, on this slide here, we have the main uh, chassis materials as well as our Arduino kit. Next slide here, we have our materials, the hardware we used in order to assemble everything. Uh, the total was $643.39. And here's just a representation of our project timeline. We're currently in the assembly phase, so we've got all the parts upgraded and we are working on putting them together. Uh, next week we'll be working on getting the final project documentation ready and for our, our product demo. Our product demo is next Monday. Uh, thank you. All right, do you have any questions? Okay, um, thank you for the presentation. So I have uh, two questions, they, they kind of go hand in hand. So the first one is, <clears throat> so for your device, right? So how did, uh, I guess what I'm trying to understand is, what parameters was your device testing, right? What were the parameters yeah. that your device was testing, number one? And if your device does achieve is successful in doing that, how does it compare or what advantage does it offer over what's already in the market? Maybe yeah. what's something that can be purchased? What, what are the advantages of that? Yeah, so um, what our device is measuring is the RPMs of the input and output shafts that the primary and secondary clutch of the CVT are on. That allows us to um, properly tune both the primary and the secondary to get like the engagement RPM, shift rate, you know, control various factors in order to have a better accelerating vehicle. Um, this is not really something that's offered on the market, uh, though a number of other teams have made similar devices for this testing purpose. So for clarity, uh, was a load somehow imparted to the engine through the transmission? And if so, how was that monitored? Um, we did not have a way uh, in this iteration to uh, impart any kind of load on the engine. That would be one of our you know, next steps in you know, doing the second iteration, which would probably just be a, a, rig, a testing rig on the car itself. 
which would allow an accurate measurement. So to be clear, the uh, requirement, the initial requirement coming yes. in for a dynamometer, yeah. usually I think load and speed, yeah. but was it reduced the requirement to just record RPM? So um, this may be an issue with just correct, uh, you know, phrasing and nomenclature. A lot of the teams who make these devices, they call them dynamometers and dynos, but generally they measure RPM rather than like load and, you know, testing engine torque or power. So I guess to further go on with that question, the objective currently for our machine is to measure the, uh, just the overall shift rate and we can change the shift rate in accordance with our varying parameters. So initially, that's just our initial plan for our first iteration and continuing on further, we, had, we do have uh, further plans to implement load, uh, but for this current iteration, we will not be doing that. So just to follow up on that, so if, again, when, when you measure that data, how, how are you planning to, how are you collecting it and how are you making it accessible to the user that's doing the testing? All right. So uh, the uh, data is collected by the Arduino, which sends uh, a CSV, which sends like a CSV file to uh, it creates a CSV file to on the computer, which uh, we have a Python script running that plots the file and compare and it, so it plots the file in, and it just shows you how what the, how the RPM changes depending on like on your, on your current CVT configuration. We're we're going to test accuracy of the accuracy of the data to the current tiny tag that we have in the shop. To make, to make sure that the data we're getting is accurate. Uh, so you guys did your factor safety calculations. What was your requirement for that? Did you have a factor of safety you were trying to achieve? And how will that be impacted if you guys recalculate your force load? So in terms of our factor of safety, we wanted to achieve anything above two. And this would give us a reasonable threshold if there were any freak load cases. Um, given that the um, shielding, the radial shielding, and the um, bearing blocks over exceeded that threshold, uh, we uh, continued on with our design given our results. All right, thank you very much. Uh, congratulations on your last present final presentation. Let's give them a round of applause. All right, and you guys, me. So our next group is our cushioning system. Come on out. I see uh, the clients up there. Do you want to come up front? Professor up. McAlpine? Or you just want to stay back there? Okay. All right. We have two. Stay low. <laughs> All right. You guys got your mics? Hello. Okay. All right. Hello, everyone. We're team off the trail, and our project was an adjustable cushioning backpack system. My name is Omar Guerra. I'm Kira De La Camera. I'm Donna Fiestas. And I'm Shannon Finch. Now, I'm sure you're wondering why an adjustable backpack system, so some background. Our client is Ellie Van Gemeren. She's an elementary school teacher with scoliosis, who is also an avid hiker. So scoliosis is a health condition that deals with an atypical curvature of a spine, which causes a lot of chronic pain and discomfort. And for our specific client, um, her backpacking trips involve carrying roughly 50 pounds around for typically three days at a time, which really exacerbates her condition. So to get into requirements, since our project was a redevelopment of last semester's, we really wanted to change our goal. So we wanted to develop a more comprehensive and specialized backpack that meets our client's needs while simultaneously minimizing discomfort, improving posture, and increasing mobility. So we broke up our requirements into three separate sections, mechanical, performance, and regulatory. So under mechanical, we wanted to make sure our system was well padded to alleviate any pressure while making materials breathable to avoid any sweat or discomfort there. We also wanted to be sure we complied with any relevant industry standards, as well as making it adjustable for multiple different people. Under performance, we wanted to make sure it operated under different weather conditions, as when you're hiking, 
different things can happen. And we wanted to make sure we alleviated pressure for that 50 pounds, as I had mentioned earlier. And as for regulatory, we wanted to adhere to the Consumer Product Safety Commission standard for flammability of clothing textiles. And now I'm going to pass it on to Donna to talk about designs. Okay, thank you. So as an overview of our previous designs, two prototypes were developed. The first prototype was a CAD model, which consisted of completely eliminating the valve system implemented by last semester's capstone group, and instead providing cushioning in the main areas of discomfort, including the shoulders, back, and hips, as well as detachable pouches on the side of the book bag to help with weight distribution. The issue with this system was that it was more fixed and adjustable than we would have preferred, as well as no variation in support type. So moving on to the second prototype, we decided to bring back the valve system for only the lower portion of the backpack while keeping the cushioning for the top half of the backpack. The issue with this prototype, though, was that the valve system was bulky and unattractive, as seen in figure two, circled in red, as well as the cushioning was still fixed to the top half of the book bag. Okay, so after analyzing these issues with the previous prototypes, our final design consists of four main components. The first one being hyperelastic polymer smart comfort grid cushioning that we cut into three five by four by one inch individual components. These components were then placed into fabricated pockets made from moisture wicking material and closed shut with Velcro. The second component was a simple air valve system that was constructed from two air wedge bags. Both were equipped with a quick release air release push button. This allowed air to flow in and out of the pockets very easily. And as mentioned before, they, these same air valves were placed in customized pockets. The third component was a 3D air gap strap pad that was attached to the backpack's shoulder straps via Velcro. And the fourth and final component was a mesh back panel that was sewn with buttons placed equal distance apart from each other that was used to attach both the cushioning component and the airbag components to the panel, so essentially this entire system was connected to this back panel that's then attached to the backpack via parachute buckle, allowing the system to be transferable and portable to any backpack. So in summary, our final design details consist of a hybrid system. It's a combination of pneumatic valves in conjunction with an added mesh back panel and a cushioning support. The singular check valve system was reduced to the lower portion of our backpack, again, making it easy for air to flow in and out of the pockets. It is adjusted using the pump circled in orange in figure nine. If you pump this up, more airs flowed into the pocket and you click the push release button, airs then um, dissipated. The hyperelastic polymer smart comfort grid material is temperature neutral and, absorbed and effective in absorbing and redistributing pressure. This allows the backpack to be pushed off of the user's back, allowing for more um, a release of pressure and improved comfortability. The tension mesh back panel improves posture and provides ventilation by increasing airflow. This is adjusted using the back straps attached to the panel. The tighter you pull down on them, the tighter the mesh panel is increased. And comprehensively, this system is also accompanied by strap pads that have 3D air gap cells. In between each cell is a groove, and the groove accelerates airflow and improves um, compression on the shoulder. Okay, so moving on from the design portion, testing had to be conducted on the system to make sure that it would work and meet the requirements. So in the early stages, an FEA analysis was performed on the cushioning material to see how it would behave under an applied force of 50 pounds. The results show that it displayed very low stress, strain, and displacement, leading the team to believe that it would be durable and effective in alleviating pain and relieving pressure off of the client. During the later testing stages, physical applications were uh, evaluated. So we used a comparative and material testing. And we did a 50 pound weight testing on each material, as well as environmental testing for each weather. So we mimicked each weather condition. Later on, we were able to test the backpack on five different people with five different back concerns, such as scoliosis, spondylolisthesis, and standard. The, the survey consisted of breathability, adjustability, and easy use, and the overall comparison of the backpack with and without the system. Overall, our results were an eight out of 10 in each section. To ensure that our product was effective, we asked a couple of experts for their opinions. Connor Donahue is a PTA at an orthopedic center. He said that he liked our adjustability of our cushions because each patient endures pain in different areas as well as Kate Whip, an athletic trainer here at UMBC, suggested that we should make it more universal. So we added the buttons onto the mesh panel so our client can move around the pouches. 
and Kyle Yost, a doctor who is a specialist in orthopedic medicine, sports medicine, proposed that we should add shoulder straps on the, should we should add padding on the shoulder straps. And our budget was a total of $224.45, which consisted of all the materials applied here in the description. Finally, our timeline, we set up biweekly meetings with Ellie, which developed our customer requirements, and we developed our CAD prototype, which was presented in our first prototype presentation. So then we redesigned and ordered our materials. In the late stages, we were able to survey five people with the backpack and various back concerns. In the future, we will finish up our lab reports and, I mean, sorry, our final reports, <laughs> our final reports and uh, our final adjustments to the material and the backpack and set up a demo time with Professor Grianis and our client. Thank you very much. Questions. Any questions? I do. Um, so I was actually here last semester when they presented their backpack design. I know, I think they had leaks and issues with that. Did, have you seen any issues of leaks in your design? Uh, so I can elaborate on that. For, so the leaks for last semester was actually because they had glued their own pouches back on together. So they had cut the pouches and glued it together. But this pouch, it comes directly from the manufacturer itself. So there shouldn't be any leaks or it minimizes all the leaks that could possibly happen. Did you guys take weight into consideration when designing it? I know you guys did the 50 pound applied force, but what was the overall weight of the system? Sorry, could you repeat the question? We couldn't really hear you. Um, so when you're backpacking, weight's a big deal. As you guys mentioned, you have packs up to 50 pounds. Did you guys take into consideration the weight of the actual system itself that you were designing? And if so, what was the weight? Yeah, so when we performed testing on the backpack with the five different people, we put weights up to 50 pounds inside the backpack and had them tested out. And for the, for the system itself, um, I know the cushioning material, between the cushioning material, the back mesh design and the pouches, all of the material was like, I want to say under a pound. So overall, like the system was lighter than last semester, especially with the bulky cords and stuff like that. So we definitely tried to address that this semester. As we know, like the backpack itself is already 50 pounds. We don't want to cause any more extreme weight or any extra pain. So we tried to minimize the actual weight of our system. You mentioned the initial requirement was to make this backpack for an individual. Uh, you then got five other individuals to rate it, and they even said, well, make it more generic for other people. But I was curious, have you actually gotten any feedback from the person you made this for? Yeah, so um, the slight problem with our customer is she does live in North Carolina. So um, in order to oh, keep going. Okay. Um, so we've been in communication, like I said, with her like weekly meetings. We've proposed to her our first design, second design, and she kind of agreed with the whole universal, universal thing that um, basically, even though she does have specific type of scoliosis, as she hikes, she experiences discomfort in like various areas. So our system is adjustable in that like, as she's going on these hikes and whatnot, she can adjust the cushions or the air pouches to whatever is bothering her at the current moment. Same with any other person who's going to try it on. So when we discussed with her like our design ideas, she said it was great. She said, I really like this, especially because just because like if you saw in the first picture, her right shoulder is one of the main problem areas. She said there's also increased discomfort in her left hip sometimes when she's on these backpacking trips for like various days, obviously your entire body starts to wear down. So she really liked that. And we're gonna send off our demo days, I think the 22nd with Dr. G. Um, and we're sending the backpack to, back to Ellie for her to try too. That sounds great, I appreciate it. Uh, is, was there a graphic that actually described the various locations of the air bag and or cushion variability, like different locations you said you could move that around? It wasn't clear. From the quick presentation, I don't think I can go back. Um, I can't go back on the slides right now. But um, for the back mesh panel, so the way we set it up, so there's, if you're looking at a like rectangle per se, we have different buttons in various locations at the top. So there's two, there's three rows of buttons at the top half of a back mesh panel, and then there's buttons along the bottom as well. So the bottom is typically for the air valve system, so we can adjust those and change location on the bottom half. 
whereas the cushions can be adjusted to either like lower on the mid back or left or right, depending on the client's concern. Yep. All right, and we have one more final question from your actual client. Hey there, good job. <laughs> um, you know, your materials list, you had to go through that quickly, so maybe I missed it, but uh, did you have to purchase the, the blood pressure uh, cuff bulbs or um, were you able to utilize components from the previous design? So, um, does someone else want to talk? Um, so, we, based off um, what we heard of like feedback from last semester, their valve system wasn't working and because they made it like as their own, we decided to order just air valves separately. So, it's an entire individual system. All of it came pre-connected. So, the manufacturer basically confirmed that it shouldn't leak and whatnot. So, that's what we decided to go with to avoid any issues. So no components were utilized from the no, previous system? No, we all knew, yeah. All right, and uh, Richard White, who's from Lockheed Martin, is actually online and said that the, actually this may be, have an application to military. Their military soldiers are typically tearing 75 to 100 pounds of gear on their backs. So congratulations on your final presentation. All right, our next team is actually BG&E. Uh, I believe it's the wire cutting system. Here you go. And just let the, I believe it works. Hello. Hello everybody, uh, we are the drone uh, wire cutting team. My name is Foley Colby. I'm Cheyenne Hagedis. I'm Brandon Mudd. I'm Jaden Gopez. Our client BG faces uh, cable damage uh, in serious storm and uh, this can be a serious hazard for the public. Uh, clearing those uh, damaged cable require a lot of time and resources. So our goal here is to design an attachment to a DGI 300 drone cable capable of cutting energized cable. For our requirement, uh, our attachments must not weigh more than uh, six pounds. Uh, should give a two feet clearance for a drone to cut easy to attach and detach. Uh, so we started our design with a, a rough sketch and we had three main options for our cutting mechanism. So uh, after meeting with uh, our client, the third option was the best one, which, we, which is to design an attachment around an existing tool uh, capable uh, and uh, proven to be working on the field. So the tool we are working with it is eight pound, which is more than the required uh, payload for the drone. And we decided to go with a proof of concept. So with that in mind, we started our first prototype by building uh, a cardboard pro uh, prototype and uh, we move on to uh, a 3D uh, model. And uh, our model has four main parts. We have the bottom plate that will be connected at the bottom of the jaw. We have the arm. Uh, we have the adjustable bracket. And we have the clamp that will hold the tool. And that's the full assembly over there. For our mounting plate, we initially were going to remove the landing gear and attach it to um, the screw holes there. But we, after seeing the drone in person, we were able to discover that there was four screw holes on the bottom of the drone. Um, we also discovered that we needed to provide a gap between our plate and the drone due to air vents on the bottom. And so we decided to go with our a the part as seen in, on the upper right, um, it's going to be made out, we initially made out of 3D printed material, um, and initial testing showed that 
there was a max stress of about 1,016 PSI around where the plate and the um, arm box attached, which is well below the compressive and tensile stress. Um, testing showed for, for that part that it was going, it was that the um, screw holes on the um, part didn't line up, so we, but we continued testing with that part anyways. We attached an eight pound dumbbell, as seen on the picture on the left, um, and we, it, to simulate the um, system, and we saw slight deformation in the 3D printed part. Th that caused us to change our design approach to make it out of metal. At our, we had a friend that was able to donate, their, uh, uh, donate the part to us out of 116 steel, and we added a um, back wall to the box so to um, prevent um, the arm from overextending. Here's a close-up CAD of our adjustable bracket. On the left, we have the male bracket. In the middle, we have the female bracket and clamp. And on the right, we're showing the female and male parts mated. For the male bracket, we've done some stress analysis. We've applied an estimated 28 pound force torque to the teeth area, and we're expecting the part will have a max stress of 330 PSI. And we 3D printed this part, but we were concerned with the layer lines of 3D printing, so we opted to resin cast this. And the liquid plastic we use is or has a compressive strength of 3,800 PSI and a tensile strength of 3,000 PSI. In the pictures, you can see the, oh, not anymore. Um, for the female bracket, we have the, we've also done some stress analysis. We've applied the same torque to the teeth area, and we're expecting this to have a max stress of 600 PSI. And we've 3D printed this part as well, but we, were cons but we also plan to resin cast this, but due to issues in the casting process, we decided to move forward with 3D printing, and we 3D printed this in PLA and at 100% infill. We've also researched and discovered that 3D printed PLA can reach an approximate compressive strength of 9,000 PSI and an approximate tensile strength of 10,000 PSI. You can see the 3D printed clamps and bracket. Here we're showing off the adjustable bracket at different angles and holding the tool. So for our assembly testing, we also um, tested to see if the plate fully lined up with the drone and after slight adjustments to the arms of the plate, we were able to get it to fit. We also made sure, as, or the picture on the right shows the assembly fully attached to the drone and slightly suspended in air. Um, we found that the assembly without the tool weighed about 2.8 pounds, while the, with the tool it weighed about um, 10 and a half pounds. This is a um, video of our assembly without the tool attached to the drone. As it, as it goes up, the arm has some slight sway to it, which um, we need to um, design a, a larger back wall to hopefully counteract that and maybe add something to the front to get rid of um, the front sway. And that's the drone landing. Right, so we, real quick, our total project cost came out to about $325, rounding up. The resin casting, due to the number of things we had to buy to make that work, ended up being our most expensive portion. And for the project, the brainstorming took us about a little over a week. Preliminary design took us three days to land on. The mechanical prototype took us 10 days to design and put together. And the CAD prototype took us a little over a month to put together. Material selection took the two months uh, from the mechanical prototype through the CAD prototype due to dependence on the CAD. And the final prototype took us a little under a month to put together. For our next steps, we need to create the tool guide that will guide the wire into the jaws of the tool. And we need to manufacture 
redesign the base plate a little bit and manufacture a new one to try and reduce motion in flight, we are going to need to redesign the arm head to be compatible with a different tool. We need to check compatibility of the new base plate with the drone and set up a plan for further development for BGE and finish up our paperwork. Real quick, I appreciate uh, the effort. It uh, looks like a nice project. I uh, do have maybe a, a quick generic question in terms of um, it appeared the arm that was going, that's you know, made or designed to hold the actual tool was articulating uh, because you couldn't uh, take off or you couldn't be on the ground because it, it extended beyond the legs of the drone, and then it had to rotate around, and at that point, it was, uh, it was never f affixed, it was never tight. So I was curious, uh, you know, are, was the plan to somehow have that, uh, a controlled arm to maneuver at different angles, and were you somehow supposed to you know, guide it onto some wire at some point. I, I'm, I'm kind of curious how this, how you envision this working in doing its actual requirement of cutting a wire. So the arm itself, it what I think we might have briefly at first considered a mechanical concept that, where you could control more than just having the tool cut the wire, but due to time constraints and how long we thought we, that would take us with wiring and trying to figure out the robotics and everything, we just switched to a pure, purely mechanical system for simplicity. And the idea is that it will just hang underneath the drone and it will have a larger guide so they can just bring it over the wire and then down and the guide will help make precise aiming a little less necessary so it will just guide the wire into the jaws of the tool and then the tool itself is remote controlled so they just hit a button and it cuts the wire. A question uh, initially you said um, I guess it was your face plate there that deformed under some testing. Does that imply that your initial analysis was way off or what? You change the material of steel. Um, we only changed the material due to the um, deformation of the PLA material that we used to 3D print it. We were also kind of worried that um, the printing lines on the PLA were a little off. But that's what I was getting at. Initially, you had designed it for the 3D printing, right? Yes. But it didn't live up to the design or what? Um. Uh, we, were, we were worried about uh, the heat too. Like uh, it's going to be outside. So we were thinking uh, PLA, maybe the heat might deform me. So we, we went to metal design. So. Gordon touched on that a little bit. So the bigger requirement here was to be able to cut the wires, right? Um, so now I appreciate what you did in terms of just designing the arm, the attachment to the drone, but it seems like your focus was more so the attachment aspect to the drone and you didn't really put a lot of energy and focus on the cutting aspect. Why, um, could you explain your process to why you, you went to focus on the attachment and put so much energy on the attachment itself versus focusing on the, the cutting aspect itself? Because that seems like the bigger objective here. Yeah, I can do this. Yeah, so we've researched um, how the linemen actually cut wires, and there already exists a remote control tool that they put on a hot stick to go up there and cut the wire. And that tool is remote controlled and it's light, but it's very expensive. So the tool that we are working with right now is uh, not remote controlled currently, but it's a proof of concept to pursue that tool. So the reason why we're not 
focusing too much on the tools because the tool we plan to use is already remote controlled and we want to make sure our project is the attachment. Like our project is the main focus of the attachment from the tool to the drone. So the goal then was to design the vehicle that transports that tool for it to do the job. Is that, is that the goal? Correct. Oh, sorry. So we have our client here today, so he's just going to ask you a question. Hey, good morning, everyone. Um, so I'm, I'm with the BGE team, and I just wanted to address that last part. So the, uh, the remote wire cutter that we essentially wanted them to be able to attach to the drone, uh, it's, it's suffering from supply chain issues, like everything else. It's about a $3,000 tool. Uh, so we have it on order, and we're hoping it's going to arrive. But as soon as that gets in, the team will be able to test uh, their attachment arm. So I just wouldn't want them to be docked points because we didn't provide them with the tool. But essentially, um, as, as we've seen it, their arm will support the tool. And then it's just a matter of our pilots um, positioning the, the drone and then getting it onto the wire. And then the tool has a, uh, a remote switch. So you would just hit it, and then it will cut the wire. Yeah, thanks for clarifying that. I, I had missed that aspect of it. Um, I, I thought the goal was to build the tool itself with, the, of course, the vehicle, but it's more so with the vehicle to get it to the place of fun. One, one question, really quick. Um, so the tool, because it does pick up from the ground and slide against the ground, and what is, what is your means of protecting that $3,000 tool um, when it hits the ground? Um, we would go, right now, that would be more of a next step, feature steps. Um, we have yet to try and make a concrete testing for that. All right, can we give them a round of applause? Congratulations on your final presentation. Our next group, why don't you come on out? We have our next bg &E group, which they are dealing with the switch gear. Sorry, we're running. 15 minutes behind here. Quickly. All right. There you go. Good job. All right, hello everyone. Um, our product is the Switchgear Lubricator Drone Mount. We're calling ourselves Retriever Drone Systems. I'm Allie. My name is Sam. I'm Jared. And I'm Joseph. So the company we're working for is Baltimore Gas and Electric. Our main point of contact is Clancy Richardson and our liaison is Luke Byrne. And so switch gears are integral to our project. A switch gear is a switch in an electrical system that often needs to be turned on and off and it will cut power to the system. These switch gears need to be lubricated frequently, otherwise they will corrode and they become a danger to work on. These switch gears also are often in high, hard to reach places and can be a danger to get to to do this maintenance. And right now, Baltimore Gas and Electric, they use a hot stick, which is a long non-conductive stick with a stinger lubrication tool attached to the end. This is essentially a grease gun. And they hold this stick above their head and they spray the switch gear this way. This creates a fall hazard as these switch gears can be in high places. Our solution is to attach this stinger lubrication tool directly to the drone via a mount that we're going to fabricate. And then this drone can fly up and lubricate the switch gear remotely. So our system requirements revolve around keeping the user safe and the drone safe when operating it. So the drone should be able to lubricate the switch gear from a distance of six feet or greater. We also want the nozzle of the drone, of the stinger rather, to be able to point in multiple orientations to allow for multiple angles of attack. And the system itself must weigh less than six pounds. The stinger lubrication tool weighs four pounds. So that gives us about two pounds to work with for the mount. Also, we wanted to comply with a ASTM F2910 standard, so we wanted a 1.5 safety factor on all parts, and during takeoff, our mount can deform 
but during flight it should not deform. So here's a 3D model of our mount attached to the drone. This is from SolidWorks. And here's a close-up of our actual mount. So it consists of five custom 3D modeled and printed parts. We have four clamps and three fittings. We count the clamps as just kind of one. And we have PVC for the piping. At the end, we have a hot stick adapter. This is so we can take advantage of the attachment point that already exists on the Stinger. But also, because this is a, uh, an industry like standardized like attachment point, any tool that uses the hot stick attachment system can be mounted to, this, to the drone. So here's an evolution of our prototypes. Our first prototype, we made two of them. Uh, we focused on having like a physical model of our proof of concept. We constructed one out of three quarter inch PVC and we constructed another one out of half inch PVC. We drilled and filed into existing PVC fittings and held them all together using spray on PVC glue. Moving to our second overall prototype, we learned that Modifying existing PVC fittings was a lot trickier than we expected, and the overall reliability of the mount wasn't what we were hoping for. So we went the route of 3D modeling fittings and printing them, uh, printing them out of PLA, and we also ended up printing the clamps. We did FAA analysis, and we decided to focus on just the half-inch PVC because that saved us a lot of weight and also cost. So our current design, which is all the way on the right, not much has changed from the second prototype, except it's now black, but also we've now split the clamps so that way they can clip on and off the drone legs and they're held together with zip ties, two for each clamp. Also, there, there's a stem that sticks off the main body of the clamp. From the FAA analysis, we can see that clamps experience the most stress, so we filleted the edge where they meet together to hopefully alleviate some of that stress. Here's the FAA analysis. Why we want to do this is, uh, what this allows us to do is subject our model to loads and forces and see how it would react. SolidWorks allows us to define these parts and pieces as materials, so that way in simulation, they exhibit their material properties of their real world counterparts. We defined each fitting and clamp as PLA, and the tubes are all PVC, half inch PVC. We applied a load of six pounds to the end of the hot stick adapter. Even though we only expect to experience four pounds, we wanted to ensure that 1.5 factor of safety. It experiences a maximum force of 2.3 times 10 to the 6 von Mises stress. This is one whole order of magnitude less than the rated yield strength of PLA. And you can kind of see it at the red spots of where the clamps are on the left and bottom right. So moving on from prototype two, we also had a chance to actually test that model in the field. BGE had allowed us to come out to their flying facility. On the uh, left side, you can see a picture of how our model will fit onto the drone. It slides up underneath the drone and clips in from the bottom. This is to help prevent needing to remove the legs. This is an expensive drone and we'd prefer to make it easier for our client. And on the right, the right side, you can see how the stinger actually attaches to our mount. Uh, this is the explanation for why we had to bring the hot stick adapter so far out. Fortunately, the stinger is a quite large device and the drone just isn't large enough to have the stinger underneath it, so it had to be brought forward a bit. And yeah, so moving on as well, that day we also had a test plan we wanted to bring with us just to verify as many of our requirements as we could that day. So for the ground tests, we wanted to verify that the drone fitment was proper and we found that to work, that we could see the stinger from the built-in camera, as well as the weight of the system. We found that SolidWorks had told us about 0.75 pounds for those parts. We were closer to about 1.1, but this was still less than two pounds, so that worked for us. What we did not meet was that the stinger was mounted, could be mounted at all these angles, 45 upwards and 90 downwards. We ended up resolving this with a future fix by extending the nozzle, which we will show in a future slide. Also on that day, we tested our drone flight. Um, we flew up with the mount attached, we also flew with the stinger, and we also added a water bottle to the stinger to simulate the weight of the lubricant. Unfortunately, we do not have access to lubricant, so we couldn't test the full functionality of the system. That's why that last one is still red. Um, this is just a quick little picture of that flight. As you can see, the mount is not deformed in flight, and the stinger is held in position by the hot stick adapter, which was good for us. We were very happy with this picture. And this should be a short video of a flight test. As you can see, when taking off, there's a little bit of vibration. That is mostly due to the drone needing to calculate its center of gravity. But here you can see drone flying around with the stinger held at a constant position with no vibration. This device designed was a uh, nozzle guide and extender. 
it allowed us to, it served two purposes. One was to create a longer tube to move the stream of lubricant outside the prop wash generated by the drone and guide that tube with a 3D printed extender. Next slide. In terms of fabrication, we originally planned to use carbon fiber. However, due to the prohibitive cost, we are going with PLA and PVC. PLA and PVC have passed all of our load and deformation tests. However, the, still, the team still recommends carbon fiber due to its lighter weight. In terms of our budget, two prototypes and tools came out to $51.95. In terms of our future timeline, we hope to have a final test flight somewhere around the 18th or the week of the 18th, and we hope to have our final report and poster finished by the 22nd. Any questions? Um, question, in terms of just the, the vibration, as you mentioned, during takeoff, um, there seems to be some level of vibration is that only during takeoff, or does it happen whenever the drone is in is is in that standing position or in uh, you know not moving? So that's the first question. And then as a follow up with that, um, have you thought about um, addressing that on a long term basis in terms of just the mounting? You know, over to, over a long period of time, that vibration is going to start causing deformations and potential failure, how are you planning, how you thought about that and how you plan to address it? So in terms of the vibration on takeoff, um, based on some of the longer videos that we had, that was a clipped version. In some of the longer videos, we haven't seen the vibration past that point. So when it's been flying around, it seemed to be pretty stable and not vibrating that we can see. Also on takeoff, the DJI M300 drone does a calibration check of all of its parameters. So when it's lifting up that first time, it hasn't done that check yet. Um, I think also that day too, we were testing that with a water bottle and we had found that that water bottle actually had a lot of movement inside of that. When we removed that water bottle, it didn't shake. So we think part of that might've been our, our, I hate to say like shoddy test method with there, but we just wanted to verify that we could hold that weight up. Um, so long term wise, in terms of the vibration, um, PLA and the PVC does have a very slight flex to it. And we found that it somewhat dampens the vibration. However, from our experience, we flew it for about five to 10 minutes in the air and we kept it steady. We flew in a circle and we didn't really observe too many vibrations. However, I think that's something we should consider in future design for the end of this product. So thank you. Yes, um, two questions, maybe one to follow, <clears throat> to follow up on that question and that is, you may consider looking at the resonant frequency of your overall device and, and its compliance that would enter into any sort of frequency of vibration that you are seeing uh, that you might want to eliminate. Uh, whether it's induced by some sort of fluid that you're carrying or just the simple fact that the, uh, the wind is uh, oscillating back and forth, but you just might want to consider that and how you might stiffen things up. Uh, the second thing was associated with the, um, the adhesion or methodology you were using to adhere between the PVC and the PLA. I was curious if that, uh, that junction or, you know, the, between those two properties, how that was tested and evaluated for any sort of uh, operation and longevity of the uh, so actually the whole prototype and product um, they're not adhered together it's all friction fit and uh, because of how we've set up the mount when it attaches to the legs uh, and the shape of the truss it locks in the pieces and there's no like it doesn't allow them to slide together and we were looking at using once we finalized our design, we were looking at using an adhesive, um, probably just some sort of super glue bonder just to set the pieces. And I think a big, a big part of our product is that to make one product itself, once you have the tools and everything, it really only costs about $15. So in terms of longevity, like compared to the $50,000 drone, this part is really like easy to replicate and replace. And so if something were to go wrong, it, it is an easy product and a cheap product to replace. Two questions. Um, one, did you guys do any measurements before or after flight to see if there was any deformation on the parts? 
I believe that we did take some pictures and didn't see any significant deformation of the parts after flight. Um, we haven't done any longer term testing beyond a brief check after each flight. To briefly address why the pieces were friction fit, that was because we weren't entirely sure of the fitment just yet and we wanted to be able to cut down the PVC if necessary to make it better fit before we finalized the prototype. Okay, and a quick comment, not really a question. Um, be careful when you say it's okay if it fails because it's cheap because those job site safety is a huge concern and you don't want an object up in the air falling and down hitting one of the linemen. So just Thank you. keeping safety in consideration too. And just remember, we also have, you'll be seeing them outside in the atrium. So if you have any more questions, feel free to ask them there. All right, congratulations to your final presentation. Thank you very much. And our next group is also another BGE &E group. We have four BGE &E groups uh, this year, and uh, it is our nest removal group. Come on out. You hiding? There you are. <laughs> You're good. Hello everyone, this is the final presentation for NestQuest. We're team 15 and I'm Sydney Simmons. I'm Paige Arthur. I'm Maddie Gruhl. And I'm Lauren Wagner. So just a little bit of background, our client is BG&E and we're working with Clancy Richardson. And the overall goal for the project is to develop a payload for a DJI Matrice drone that would be able to remove osprey nests and fallen branches from power poles. This would eliminate the need to de-energize the system, increase the safety of the workers, and decrease their liability to injury. So for our system requirements, the payload itself will attach to the drone, and it shall not interfere with the camera or landing gear. Now, the drone has a carrying capacity of six pounds, so the payload should not exceed that limit. And if it does, it will be able to detach from the drone. And the payload must be made of a non-conductive material, and the drone must remain five feet away from the power lines. So this is the evolution of our design. On the left is BGE's prototype, and on the right is our team's prototype. So we went from an open-ended detachment system to an enclosed detachment system with a spring release mechanism. And we were also considering, we also added a logging hook head. So for fabrication, all of the hook heads are 3D printed in PLA. You can see on screen there just some of the details of how they were 3D printed. And then anything else such as ropes, clips, or magnets were purchased from Home Depot. So for testing, it was a lot of trial and error, so designing, testing, and then a lot of redesigning. <laughs> but as far as our system requirements, um, the assembly of the system verified that we could attach to the given drone while not obstructing the camera or the landing gear. The demonstration or testing of our system verified that the detachment mechanism would activate at the given weight and that the clips would be able to pick up branches and remove them. The analysis of our system would show that the total weight is less than six pounds and also made of a non-conductive material. And here you can see a video of BGE's initial prototype. We are testing this by hand on a mock nest that we made. And so you can see there us moving some branches around with it. And then this is our initial prototype of the grappling hook style head. As you can see, it's much smaller and flatter than BGE's prototype of the grappling hook, so it was much less effective at picking up branches. And then finally, we have the logging hook style head, as you can see Sydney is holding. This one was the most effective, which was measured by the amount of branches it removed per minute. As you can see here, it did very well. So our main observations from our initial prototypes were that the grappling hook was better at kind of loosening the branches up while the logging hook head was better at actually picking up and removing the branches. We did notice during testing that the logging hook would sometimes overlap on itself, closing in too much, which was an issue. We also noticed that with the grappling hook style head that the branches would sometimes fall in between the arms of the uh, grappling hook. Overall, both hooks were very light and easily affected by wind, 
And at this stage, we also decided that we would need an additional camera on the drone attached by a gimbal payload. This would give the pilot a 360 view and easier navigation. So for our detachment device, we ended up using a magnetic release system instead of our initial spring-loaded concept. We have magnets with a pull force rating of four pounds that sit within the 3D printed case, as you can see in the photo. And we tested our pull force rated four pounds using a hanging force test gauge. So we were able to go and visit BGNE's test site and actually test using the drone. As you can see in this video, um, our release system does not activate as the bucket is only three pounds, so it's under the weight limit. And then in our next video, the, devi the detachment device does activate as the bucket here is about six pounds. So we were successfully able to show our, de our detachment device. So based on our initial prototype test, we redesigned our grappling hook. So we increased the weight and size. We added two additional prongs to decrease the gap and also increase the prong curvature. So as you see in the video, the redesigned grappling hook is picking up a bucket and sticks. Um, again, based off of our testing, we redesigned our logging hook, uh, again, increasing the size and weight, adding an additional two prongs, and ensuring that the prong arms would not overlap and close in onto each other. And as the video shows, it's able to pick up branches, and when maneuvered properly, it can release them as well. And this is the final design of our system. It features four subsystems. There are clamps that attach to the drone's landing gear, and this is made of 3D printed material. We have a rope that's made of paracord material. There is the detachment device, which is the 3D printed enclosement with the magnets inside. And we have the attachment heads, which are the grappling hook and the logging hook. And these two can be easily interchanged via the magnet detachment system. <laughs> In the photo, you can see our total system as well in the table, you can see a weight stack up of our system. We decided to do an analysis using the total weight of the system, um, specifically with the logging hook, just because it weighed significantly more than the grappling hook. And we found the whole system to be about 1.5 pounds. This will leave about 4.5 pounds left for the drone to pick up before the detachment device detaches. And this would be to keep the drone safe. This is the budget for our system. As you can see, it's both cost effective and it's great at completing the task of the project. And then this is the project timeline for the whole entire project. For the first time period, we focused on the system requirements and the conceptual design of the overall system. In the second time section, we focused on the hook heads, both the grappling and the logging hook. In the third, we focused on the breakaway system, making sure it would break away at the right time and at the right weight. Next, we focused on a complete system testing and analysis, just working out any small issues we still had. Then we had our final presentation, what we do right now. And we have a product demo at BGE on May 23rd, and we're finishing up all our final reports. Does anyone have any questions? Did you guys do any engineering analysis looking at the weight load on the hooks or the rope or anything like that? Besides yes. The so we did actually. We didn't have enough time, sadly, to include it in here, but we did FEA analysis on all of the hook heads. And we did it of extra weight, more than six pounds, just to make sure. And all of them were nowhere near failure. And so that was just to, to make sure that they wouldn't break before the release mechanism triggered. And so, yeah, all of them looked great. What did you guys use as your requirement for the strength of the 3D printed material with 30% infill? I couldn't, could you say again? Okay. Um, for the 30% infill, did you take that into account when doing your calculation since it's going to be weaker than the rated material properties? Um, we used SolidWorks and so we just assumed that it was fully solid. So we weren't able to do the 3D infill or at least uh, I wasn't sure how to do that for the 3D print, but we did make the material PLA um, when we did do the analysis. Um, were there any applicable codes that you had to refer to and, and ensure that you adhered by during this prototype and design process? Can you repeat the question? Were I'm there sorry. any applicable codes, you know, whether local oh, or federal, that you had to review? And uh, oh, like standards? Yes. 
Yes. Is that what you're Yes. Yeah, so most of the standards that we found were having to do more with the pilot and the drone itself, like regulatory, like you have to have it, um, you know, uh, registered and stuff like that. Um, we did also mention in here about the uh, five feet away um, for safety reasons of the drone. That's also why the rope is so long. And um, also the non-conductive material near power lines were the main ones. Since it's um, five feet long and kind of light, has there been any issues of downwash from the drone? Yeah, and I was going to say in the beginning we had that issue a lot, but then in the second prototype we worked that out because um, we did notice that a lot. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes, for sure. Um, can I can you bring it to me? What's that? What do you want me to do? Um, can you feel how <laughs> but we definitely experienced a lot of uh, a lot more wind force from the drone than we had initially expected. Um, and as you saw in the video, the logging hook day was a really windy day, and it was severely affected by the wind. Um, so the increase of weight um, definitely helps. Just curious, your magnetic uh, detachment. Uh, I believe maybe I'm misunderstanding. Isn't there some conductive material in that? And did that negate your requirement to have non-conductive material near the wire? So the main thing that we were worried about, because um, I see what you're saying is um, the magnet inside, was the hook head itself was the main thing that needed to be non-conductive, because obviously like the drone is conductive and everything like that. So it was more the things that would actually come in contact. And since this was fully encased as well, it wasn't really a concern. Yeah. Congratulations on your final presentation. Just give them a round of applause. All right, and our next and final BGE e group is our material testing group. Come on out. And make sure you kind of stand a little like over here. Yeah, you're good. Either. Yeah. You introduce All right. We are BGE Element 1. I'm Elizabeth Daniels. Errol Mati. I'm Yafet Mabratu. And I'm Yehuda Trenyansky. So BGE has tasked Team 16 to design a portable testing apparatus, which will be used to test how different gases at different pressures will, aff will, will, will affect the leakage rate of the test gases coming out of the union fitting. Here are some key requirements set by BGE. That the apparatus shall allow test gas to flow into the system and out of the system. And any leakage coming out of the union fitting shall be captured and measured. And the test pressures that will be used will be controllable. And then the environmental requirements, it requires that the leakage coming out of the system should be safe enough not to cause pollution to the external environment. And for safety requirements, it requires that the apparatus shall follow all the safety guidelines, protocols set by BGE and the OSHA, such as wearing the safety glasses and safety gloves to operate the system. For our design, we have a a pipe inside a tub of water. In the middle of this pipe system, there is a union fitting to join together two pipe nipples. And that union isn't closed all the way so that some gas leaks out from there in a controlled manner. Then above this union, we have a cone clamped above it to capture the gas rising up. This will then change the water level in the cone, and we can measure how quickly that water level changes in order to measure the leakage rate from the union. Initially, when brainstorming, we were considering using some sort of electronic sensor to test how much gas was in sort of a closed environment, but we decided that 
using this bubble method was a lot simpler and cheaper and easier to um, create. For the fitting in the middle of these pipes, we were maybe considering using a flange, but we decided to use a union because it was a lot easier to assemble and to adjust. And lastly, for the cone that we had to position above the union, we were considering using some sort of stand or custom making it to fit around the pipe, but we drilled into the tank in order to fit a clamp onto there, which was much easier to, uh, to, to create and work with. Here are some initial designs we have. We have a, we were considering using a clamp around the fitting to sort of capture all of the gas and then test how much there is. And then we decided to put the pipe inside of the water like that, which only has an inlet and no outlet besides for the gas leaking. And in our current and final design, we have the pipe in sort of a U shape so on the left-hand side, we have uh, two parts, one to put a pressure gauge and another to attach the gas. And then we have the cone positioned above the clamp and at, uh, positioned above the union. And at the end, we have a valve to help purge the system of the gas inside of it. All right, so this is the budget breakdown. And before I get into this, I just want to say that BGE actually paid for 90% of the items you see on the table. And so to get into it, uh, our items consisted of uh, fittings, pipes, valves, and then the 150 gallon uh, water tank. And then we had the two gas tanks, which consisted of helium and nitrogen. And then we had the pressure regulator and the graduated cone. And so all these items added together amounted to a cost of $2,347. And we can go to the next slide. So over here, you can see our setup. The cone was filled up with water and then placed into the clamp to measure the leakage rate. And over here in the next video, you can see the experiment in action. You see the bubbles forming at the union due to the pressure buildup within the pipes. So for our fabrication and testing, our apparatus is built out of standard pipe fittings and valves. and then placed into this large tub, and this device is easily reproducible, and most of these parts can be found at almost any hardware store. And our testing involves the use of different gases, such as nitrogen, helium, and just air, and we measure the effect on the leakage rate based off of these gases, and also what pressure we set the system at. The testing also involves um, adjusting the union fitting to make it looser or tighter to see what the effect of the leakage rate is when we adjust those, uh, those values. All right, so for the procedure initially, before we start the experiment, we had to make sure that everyone was out of the way of the inlet and outlet areas of the pipe system. And then after that, we could purge the gas and water out of the pipes and begin the experiment. And so in order to begin the experiment, we first insert the gas at the inlet, and then we uh, close off the outlet and allow pressure to build up within the pipes. And then this way, uh, once that pressure gets to a certain point, you'll see the bubbles form at the union and go up into the graduated cone. And so how we measure this leakage rate is that we uh, jot down the different water levels within the graduated cone over a certain period of time. And in our case, this was 30 seconds. And after we collect our data, we then uh, jot it down and then we shut off the gas, uh, up and up the outlet, and uh, purge any water or gas left over in the pipes. And then after that, we set up our experiment for the next trial. So as I mentioned, our testing involved three different gases, helium, nitrogen, and air. And we performed a total of three trials per gas and pressure and method of testing. We had the union fitting all at the same torque and we also did some testing on a 1 16th inch drilled hole. Unfortunately, we were not able to, um, because we didn't have enough data and a variety of data, we were unable to um, analyze our results well enough and understand what that meant for our system. 
Real quick, our timeline, by the end of February, we met in person with our client and went over our scope. And then by, and then by March, we had constructed the apparatus with the tank, and that ended up being our final, uh, our final iteration. And then by the end of April, we had constructed, we had done several tests to test the different gases. And just last week, we tested with a different approach of a 16th inch hole. And in the future, we're going to meet with Dr. Garganis and, uh, and give our final demo. And that's all. I had a quick question uh, in terms of uh, really the, the, the original scope here. Are you trying to evaluate the leakage from a particular fitting or a hole for various gases, or is it more academic in terms of getting original data? Right, it wasn't clear. So we're testing using air, helium, and nitrogen, and so we're having two, uh, so you're talking about the leakage at the union, right? Yeah, so we're gonna test at the union, and then just recently, we actually drilled a hole into the pipe to test it from there as well and see how that affects the leakage rate compared to the union. Oh, sorry. But I meant, was, was the original intent here to uh, evaluate it, the, the union itself? Did so, you obtain the data? The purpose of this is to test how different pressures and how different gases uh, reacts to the same sort of leakage and how changing the pressure or changing the gas would change the leak rate of it. Yeah, and we can also change any sort of fitting depending on what BGE would like to test. So then, um, are you not, so you're not, the goal is not to deliver a device that can do this for the client? Is not that the goal? Is that for you, your team to actually do the testing yourselves? Or is the ultimate goal to deliver a device that can do this? In yeah. In this case, BGE. Yeah, so our goal is twofold. First, we want to create this device. And secondly, we want to set up a testing procedure to be able to do further tests in the future. We didn't need to conduct as many tests as we needed to to like determine the the relationship. What we needed to do was create the device and create a testing procedure so that anyone else can use the device and um, and get results from that. So our testing was just to ensure that the procedure worked and that we were getting data from it. Does that answer your question? Yeah. Thank you. Just curious, uh, since you're developing a test procedure and an apparatus uh, to be evaluated later, was there any emphasis or desire to have more automated uh, data processing versus just visually uh, observing and timing with a time uh, stopwatch, uh, the difference in height? So we tried different methods. We tried um, using a phone camera to like sort of log at different moments what the gas level was at. And we tried just timing the difference between two different water levels. Um, but we didn't have any sort of, uh, automation was sort of out of the scope of this. We just wanted to um, sort of time how fast the, the gas was filling up the, the cone. All right, can we give them a round of applause? Congratulations on your final presentation. And I do appreciate you bearing with a little bit. It is quite cold in here. We'll be able to. We have three more groups left, and we'll probably go a little bit, a little after 11. So uh, thank you very much. We're a little behind. OK, our next group is the amino acid printing group. Come on out. Alrighty, good morning. Uh, welcome to our final presentation. My name is Zaria Oliver. My name is Abinu Acho. My name is Hidayah Sadiq. And my name is Dexter Merritt. 
And our team name is Life's Building Blocks. And yeah, this is our final product. So why do we care about proteins? Well, from the point of you being a single-celled organism to now, you have been growing, your body has been repairing itself, uh, fighting uh, off illnesses, um, and transporting nutrients. And all of this is with the help of proteins. Um, and this is why it's so important to do um, intensive research on the proteins that we already know about, as well as the possibility of proteins that we don't know about yet. This is Dr. Steven Freeland. He is a biology professor here at UMBC, and he works in the INDS department. His project goal for us was to create a small, lightweight protein model kit that contained the existing 20 amino acids and their backbone components. Um, currently, uh, to view proteins as a, or to get a better understanding of their um, structures and their space, um, mo computer softwares are used to uh, look at it, but this, this can cause a, uh, or this gives, sorry, this, sorry. <laughs> this gives students a hard time to really understand the space that this structure takes up, um, which is why our model kit would help. It would not only help with life science students, but also Dr. Freeland uh, with his current research as he's looking into the possibility of new amino acids. So our system requirements are that we should have full rotation between the molecules in our model kit um, and on our protein structure. They must hold their position once rotated. Um, for forces, they must withstand 10 pounds of tensile and compressive forces, as well as hold a 15 link backbone chain for the molecule without falling apart, and that would be our minimum. Um, it should also be scaled down from a previous iteration used by Dr. Freeland. And we would also like the molecules to be color-coded so that you can differentiate between them. Lastly, the product geometry should mirror Van der Waals models as the molecules do in real life. So on this slide, we just have um, uh, examples of our different pieces that are going into our backbone. So in the first picture, we have our alpha carbon. And in the second picture, we have our nitrogen carbon. These two pieces together will make up our backbone, which is the main structure of the protein model. And below, we have one of the 20 existing amino acids, glutamine, which along with the other 19 amino acids would cause um, the customization of the pro different types of proteins that the person would want to build. And on this slide, it basically lays out our design process from the beginning of the semester till now. So initially, we utilize a ball and socket joint along with styrofoam balls to mimic our backbone. However, upon um, further discussion with our client and analysis, we realized that this was not the appropriate solution to what our um, what our client wanted to achieve, as well as the rotation was not optimal. Which led us to our next design, which was a snap fit connection, which would be similar to something you would see on a chapstick cap or like an Easter egg. However, upon, upon further analysis, we found that this connection would probably not be able to hold itself and the pieces while the protein model was being assembled. Which led us to our current model today, which we utilize a peg and socket um, joining, me joining mechanism, and um, we tolerance the two pieces to like a two millimeter tolerance to ensure that we have the proper fit as well as um, rotation without it falling apart. And we use PETG plastic for this um, for this iteration with um, a 20% infill as well as a three millimeter wall thickness. And this was optimal to ensure that the product was still light enough to hold and um, carry around. And this slide is just showing some more pictures of our model and then a 3D printed version of the backbone. Right, so I'll talk about how we started to design our parts in CAD. So all 20 amino acids have something called a SMILES number. It identifies the amino acids, and we can plug those into a website and get a .pdb file of each individual amino acid. From there, we can convert that to a STL file, which is commonly used in CAD software like SolidWorks or Autodesk. And from there, we took those STL files and gave them some slight edits so we could put in our connector ports and construct each individual amino acid as part of our model. So 
With step two, you can see our carbon backbone, so it has blue and gray pieces. These are vital just for the construction of a protein, and then our red pieces are whole amino acids. Um, so you plug those into the gray ports of the backbone to help choose our material and make sure our materials we had access to were good for our design. We used FEA analysis, so next slide. Here's some FEA analysis on our PETG material. On the left side, you see our parts under compression. On the right side, you see our parts under tension. So we applied 10 pounds of force to all our parts at the point of the connection ports. And we decided on 10 pounds because this is a likely value that someone would use when um, putting together and pulling apart our model. As you can see, all the parts are a dark blue shade, so this basically means there's not a lot of stress affecting any deformation on the model. Next slide. This slide is basically the same thing, same amount of force applied, but we changed the material to a resin material. And um, one thing to note is, although all the parts are in a dark blue shade, meaning there's not a lot of stresses put on them. We could only do FEA analysis on solid bodies. We have a 20% infill, so we do plan on doing physical testing with a 10 pound weight to make sure that there's no deformation like we believe there will be. Okay, and this is just a summary table of our finite element analysis where you can see that we did two different materials, PETG and resin, on both uh, components of the backbone, the alpha carbon and the nitrogen piece, uh, with an applied force of 10 pounds. And then here it displays our minimum and maximum tensile and compressive stresses and a factor of safety of 15 for each. So we are currently in the final fabrication phase of our project. We are waiting on the University of Maryland College Park to 3D print our final model with their resin printers. We decided to go with a resin um, as the final material because it allows for a higher resolution, especially because we want to scale down the model that Dr. Freeland previously used. It also is more aesthetically pleasing when printing with PETG and also PLA for our previous prototypes. Um, it left a rough surface due to the supports. Resin has fewer supports and will allow a cleaner finish. And it also will define the labels as each molecule on our structure is labeled. And um, the model that we have today in the engineering bu building later, it will be very similar to the final model. However, the final model would just be scaled down. And then also in the resin model, there would be a few more holes throughout just to allow access resin to escape once it's 3D printed. This is the cost analysis um, simulated as a full modeling kit. So ideally, if we had a full modeling kit, we would have all 20 amino acids in the kit. And then we also have 15 alpha carbon and 15 nitrogen carbon pieces, which are the pieces that make up the backbone. To find the total cost of the modeling kit, we just found the weight of each piece and then um, multiply this per gram for PETG if we were to print it, and then also per, milli per milliliter for um, times the weight to see how much it would cost for a full modeling kit in resin. We found for resin it would be $43.40, and then for PETG it would be $7.90. So this is the current remaining timeline for our project. We just need to pick up the final model from UMD. We need to verify that the resin backbone can hold 15 backbone pieces. We did this with previous prototypes, but that was PETG. So we just want to confirm with resin. And then we also need to do physical testing with the weights like my colleague previously mentioned. And then of course we have a demonstration day of the full modeling kit with Dr. Gorganis and our client, Dr. Freeland. And of course we have a final project um, report. <laughs> so thank you for coming to our presentation. We are open to questions. I have a question. So I'm assuming there's already products like this out on the market currently. What, no? Um, what makes this design better than those current designs? Yeah, as mentioned, um, so currently computer softwares are used to look at the protein structure. So we did um, research into if any existing physical models um, were out there on the market and we didn't see any um, for protein structure and amino acid understanding. 
Also, something that um, organic chemistry students usually use is like a Molly Mod kit, but those utilize like ball and stick type of um, layouts, and they're very rigid. They don't really like show the actual 3D space that like molecules are taking up, so it's not really helpful to the students' like overall understanding of how these models take up space and when they're rotating, how they're moving um, against each other. Thank you. All right, two quick questions. Um, you guys said you use a two millimeter, two millimeter tolerance. Where did you guys get that number from? Um, it was basically like a trial and error type of thing with our PEG connector. Um, so we started with the um, male uh, connector part, um, just to, we sized it at a, a good size that would fit on our uh, a uh, straight end of our molecule and not take up too much space. And then from there, we would tweak and then edit, test, tweak it uh, continuously until we got to a good tolerance that fit, but still allowed for rotation. And in that rotation, it should hold its position uh, once turned. Okay, and also, in your guys' financial evaluation, did you guys take into consideration the labor cost since you are doing 3D printing out of house? Um, so in the cost analysis when I did it, we did not take into the labor costs, um, especially because when we were doing trial and error throughout um, our project, um, two of our team members have 3D printers. Um, so we figured that if someone was doing this like for themselves, like for research or something, that they would be able to 3D print it. Um, but no, um, the labor costs like for the person doing it themselves, we didn't take into account. Also, we wanted to add that um, we're still in our fabrication process with UMD, so we haven't gotten a total cost for how much it took for them to create our entire kit, so we're waiting on that still. Thank you very much. Congratulations on your final presentation. <laughs> All right, and our uh, second to last group for this morning is our ball balancer team. Come on out. Thank you. And there's another one out there. Three head groups? Uh, oh, sorry. Three groups, sorry. Our third group. There. Thank you. Hello, everyone. We are Team 7, and we worked on the ball beam balancer. My name is Femi Ajayi. I'm Nicole Atram. I'm Albert Gums. And I'm Kyle Yingling. So I'm going to start on giving some background on the project. Our client was Dr. Ankit Goh. He's a professor here at UMBC teaching controls. Uh, he basically wanted a physical example of control system. Um, so we decided on a ball beam balancer, which is something that he can have on his, or put on a desk and students can see from the back of the classroom. So the basic parts of a ball beam balance is the beam with the ball on top and a servo which works to move the beam until the ball can be balanced at a specific point. The main system requirements uh, that were important to us was the device needed to be able to fit on a student's desk, be easily carried, and be able to be visible from the back of a classroom as he teaches uh, classes full of students. So I'm gonna talk about the prototypes and design. The first, the first prototype shown on the left is a simple 3D printed prototype. Uh, it's basically a seesaw design. And the main issues with this prototype was that it didn't move correctly and the beam couldn't, the ball couldn't move across the beam correctly. So we fixed that in prototype two where we used the addition of a V-shaped beam and where the ball could move freely. But the issues in the second prototype were the fact that the angle encoder was not mounted properly, neither was a servo motor and the complexity of the linkage system. Also, the design was not to scale. The key components of the final design is the addition of the infrared sensor, the mounting of the angle encoder and servo, and the simplicity of the linkage system. Here are two, two final design photos uh, with, the, with the illustrated concepts in the previous slide. And here are the two pictures of the final design with the added circuitry. So now getting into parts and analysis for our system. 
Um, so our purchasing rationale, we need to go over this before we fabricate because we need the parts in order to construct. We wanted to start with the parts that our client had preferred that we have, an aluminum beam that was an angle, um, a stainless steel ball. We were originally going to use a potentiometer, but after our client preferred an infrared sensor to be attached to the system, we forego the stainless steel ball and use a ping pong ball. We calculated the max torque that the beam would have on the motor because it was our heaviest part of the system and we wanted to make sure our motor could hold it. After doing that, we found a servo motor that had a max torque that was higher than the max moment that the beam would create. We analyzed the linkages that we wanted to use to make sure that they would properly incorporate into the system and hold all the weight and then we finally purchased parts. So here is the calculations that we did to find the max moment of the beam on the motor. Um, so we took the volume of the beam that, we've, that we wanted to use at the length that we wanted to use um, and then calculated the moment from that. As you see, we got an approximately 38 ounce inches for the max moment of the beam on the motor and then we have um, the motor that we bought, the max torque was 44 ounce inches. And also we have an FEA of our linkages that we used, as you saw in the previous design, and you can see that they, are, they can withstand all the weight. And so finally, we have the budget that we used. Um, here's a list of all the parts. We got $1,000 from our client in addition to the $200 from our capstone. We used about 27% of our budget, so we're really happy with that. So now I'm going to go over the fabrication of our project. We split it up into four phases, uh, just so we have a better vision of what we wanted to do. Uh, for our first phase, we just created our overall structure with a horizontal and vertical brace, as well as the mountings. And for our bearings, that would hold our rotational shaft. And then we simply threaded our rotational shaft through a connector that would be able to hold our beam and then attach the two bearings either side and, and attach those to the mountings. Then we have, have our second phase, which is our most important one with our motion, sense, motion and sensing, where we create, took a connector and added, attached it to the end of the rod so that we could also attach our angle encoder so we'd be able to properly record the angle of our beam as well as add an, a secondary out housing for the encoder so it would be, uh, um, wouldn't, wouldn't rotate freely. Then we had finally added our uh, motor and its housing to, to the vertical brace and then uh, Added the uh, linkages between the motor and the beam to be able to actuate, actuate the uh, actual beam. And then we took, had a sensor that we placed on the end of the beam so it could pro properly measure the distance of the ball as well as so it would be out of the way so it wouldn't be possibly damaged by the ball. Finally, for the last uh, physical part of our design, we, cr we, had, we took all of our uh, various circuits um, and parts from our uh, mechanical parts and did a uh, soldered all the wires together as well as created a breadboard that would be able to uh, uh, create a circuit that would be able to attach to our Arduino so we could get all the input data from our, our various parts and that would go into our program that would be able to that would be, then be able to output to our motor to actuate the beam. Finally we programmed our APID controller so we'd be able to uh, figure out the actual angle that the motor would need to actuate the ball at uh, the beam at, so that the ball would be able to <clears throat> roll at in, in the proper place at equal at the, at the middle of the beam. I'm going to go through some of the testing strategies we use for our system. Um, <clears throat> so we made sure to check that the linkages could move effectively without sticking, and that the ball would move effectively across the beam. What we found with the ball moving across the beam was the metal ball that we were planning on using was too heavy. Um, the servo wasn't generating enough torque to be able to lift the beam with that heavy of a ball. And also it was reflective, which was causing problems with the IR sensor. So we ended up switching to a ping pong ball and it worked more effectively. Um, we also found that the ball, the system works better the closer it is to the sensor. Um, there is a drop off in the accuracy of the IR sensor that we used. So as the ball gets further away from the sensor, the relationship between the voltage output from the IR sensor and the distance is nonlinear. So uh, we calibrated, we did our best to calibrate uh, that relationship inside of the program that we used. And we made sure to test the angle encoder just to make sure that it was sec uh, fastened securely on there as well. So now finally to get into the timeline for the project. 
So in our first month, we started with um, really isolating the design or specifications that our, our client wanted. We went through many different iterations and um, he had different requirements as we went on and started to develop. And we did a lot of documentation as well. In the second month, we really worked on prototype, CAD, evolution, as you saw earlier, making sure that our design was constantly keeping up with the client and fine tuning his requirements. This last month has been a lot of physical fabrication, um, including purchasing, physical construction, and the coding of the project. And then work to be done, we need to perfect the PID controller to make sure that we end at equilibrium, as you'll see in the demonstration today. Um, it works almost perfectly, but not quite yet. We're going to do final um, documentation for the project, and then we're going to present to our client to make sure that we have met his needs. Thank you for coming to our presentation. So question, you, you've touched on one of them, of course, uh, saying that the, um, at least as the ball went further down, it, uh, it wasn't a linear, right, the code, so you had to calibrate it. But what are other risks associated with your design that could, of course, um, affect the, uh, you know, the, the end goal of being able to model? So what are some risks that you've seen that could affect the performance, and have you seen those, and are you communicating them? Just curious. So um, one of the risks was the steel ball. Originally, we were going to use a potentiometer and the steel ball, and that would have worked fine. Um, but we spoke to our client, and he wanted to use a infrared sensor instead of a potentiometer, which meant that the reflective quality on our steel ball would interfere with the accuracy of the infrared sensor. And we thought about spray painting it, but as a matte ball would have been more effective anyway, we decided to use a ping pong ball, which allowed us to get a cheaper sensor that didn't need to be as strong. We have been communicating with our client though the whole time. All right, did you have one more question? Are you, okay. All right, <laughs> well, they'll see you shortly afterwards. Okay, thank you very much. Congratulations on your final design, final presentation. All right, now our second to last group, which is going to be our tensegrity structure. Come on out. And as they're coming out, I just wanted to, uh, after our last group, the teams can go over to the atrium, set up all your stuff. The tables are there. We'll allow you about 10 minutes, if that's okay. All right, and then we'll get you going. And Emily and Alex will help you, okay? All right. My name is Patrick Huber. I'm Teddy Wise. I'm Albert Pham, and we are team for keeping it tight. So our team is designing and fabricating a two-stage integrity structure for Dr. Wei Dong Zhu and Dr. Sichen Wan. The structure will be analyzed to find its natural frequencies and mode shapes to verify Dr. Huan's mathematical model. Uh, last semester, Team 7 Micromodal was assigned to create a, a first stage tensegrity structure for the same purpose. Tensegrity structures are truss systems where compression members are rods and tension members are wires, and two stage refers to the connection of rods to stack two one stage tensegrity structures on top of one another. Uh, the main requirements for us is that the joints connecting the rods shall have three degrees of rotational freedom and no degrees of translational freedom. Uh, the length of the connection between the rods, or I mean the nodes and the members shall be less than 5%, and the structure shall allow for vibration of 10 hertz for 10 to the 6 cycles. Okay, so taking all that into consideration, we uh, built a conceptual mock-up made out of 3D printed ball socket joints and rubber bands. Uh, we were thinking about taking a magnetic ball joint and uh, using that, but we were worried about translational movement, so we decided to switch to a ball of socket joint. Um, then in constructing this, we weren't originally using rubber bands, and we realized how hard it was to actually construct a tensegrity structure, so we decided that we 
had to also design a construction brace. Uh, the second one, uh, we were gonna build it out of metal. Uh, we decided to switch from aluminum to steel because we were worried about uh, weak threads and uh, corrosion over time. Uh, the cable that we used here was actually identical to the cable used by Micromodal in their one stage tensegrity structure. Uh, we used a right angle ball joint since it fit our form better and we went with eye bolts for the ends because they were more light and smaller for our total assembly. Uh, we built a third prototype with three different methods of connecting wires to the joints. Uh, our first method that we came up with was just tying them to the ends, uh, using the nut to hold them in place. Uh, that was pretty loose. We didn't really like that idea. Um, it was also kind of out of line, so it wasn't a great model for what we were trying to do. We also tried uh, adding a wing nut, which uh, increased the weight unnecessarily. It also kept the wire attachments further away from the point. So we were decided to end up with drilled holes that kept them all in place where they needed to be and close to the actual node. So for our final design, uh, we managed to find a more flexible alternative to the cables that we were using. Uh, this allows them to act more like strings and be better represented by the mathematical model. The rods and strings were also increased in length, uh, up to 50%, because this would also decrease the effects of the connections that we were using. Um, and then we also switched out the eye bolts that we had been using for uh, smaller, more uh, appropriate uh, machine style screws. This is just a list of some material specifications for the parts that we use. It's all pretty standard. We talk about the uh, diameter of the wire that we used up here. Uh, it's not a whole lot to go over. But for that brace that we were talking about, what we decided we had to do in order to make sure we could tie everything together properly was we just needed to constrain some of the major parts in their correct places. So we wound up designing these brackets that we 3D printed and we screwed them together with some wooden rods and we zip tied them onto the frame so that we could make sure that all of the ball and socket joints were equal distance from the center. A little more recently, we also added some more braces, which will be visible on display in the atrium with our model, <clears throat> that just keep those parallel members parallel. As for testing, the structure will be hung from an aluminum crossbar. One end of it will be affixed to a shaker machine, which resembles a large motor the other will be left to vibrate freely in response. There's a set of three sensors, which you can kind of see over on uh, this side of the picture, which they'll all be able to measure their distance from the structure over time. And by using all three of them in tandem, we get a three-dimensional coordinate system that tells us exactly where it is. So this is our budget breakdown. On the top right is the total cost, which is $154.92. On the left side of the table, you can see which parts we end up using. And while we didn't use every part, each part gave us a better understanding of what we wanted to achieve by the end of the semester. Uh, this is the total cost for our final design. It was uh, $99.37. And finally, this is our timeline. As you can see, throughout the semester, we had multiple uh, redesigns and a lot of meetings with our client. Unfortunately, towards the end, we had a couple of setbacks as our um, ball and socket joints bolt snapped inside one of the pipes, which resulted in us ordering new parts and 
increasing the budget to about $173. Um, fortunately, the parts will arrive next week, and we should be able to complete the product before the deadline. All right, thank you. Any questions? Uh, can you guys explain to me what caused galvanic corrosion to be a concern? Oh, um, mostly just uh, we knew that this could be used anywhere and anytime in the future, so we were just being cautious. Really, is mostly just a concern about weak aluminum threads. Uh, but yeah, we were using steel and aluminum originally, so we didn't want that to uh, cause any failure. Did you do any analysis on that in terms of the strength? Uh, on the uh, threads or? The rods and, and the... In, in I mean, in general, we did like, um, we applied like a static load of 30 pounds, I believe, um, to the structure uh, just to make sure that it wouldn't fail under relatively small loads. Um, we didn't do any sort of FEA on it since uh, it, the failure points were at the uh, crimps, not really at the uh, joint connections. So uh, it was more of a friction thing. All right, congratulations on your final presentation. Thank you very much. And. Just so the colleagues know that you have people online that are giving you praises through the chat through YouTube. So if you actually want to log on to there, they're saying very nice things. All right, you're just, you can leave now. You go ahead. <laughs> All right, our last but not least for this morning, we do have another session in the afternoon. Is our uh, what are you? Your t tissue test testing. Come on out. Hello everyone, we are Team Gray Matter and we are developing the tissue testing EnviroBox. Um, I'm Micah Stahl. I'm Jamie Ringan. I'm Christian Pohl. And I'm Tyler Adkins. Uh, now on to our uh, background. Uh, so our client is the Ohio State University. Our point of contact there is Megan Allen. She's a PhD student. And our goal is to develop a temperature and humidity controlled environment uh, equipped with clamps specifically designed to hold uh, tissue samples. Next slide. Um, okay, on figure one, you can see Ohio State's current uh, um, tensile testing machine. And that is what we will be designing our chamber to fit in. And then in figure two, you can see the uh, previous testing method that they have used to test uh, an optic nerve using uh, cardboard and sutures. Next slide. So this is our uh, primary requirements. The first one being that our device will fit in that tensile testing machine seen in the last slide, which is six by six by six cubic inches. And then the next requirement is that the clamps will uh, provide enough force to hold the specimen down, but not so much force that it breaks at the ends or causes failure there. And then the next one is that the chamber will be maintained at 37 degrees Celsius. The last one is that the entire system will be, uh, remain sealed and that there will be no leak, water leakage anywhere. So now onto our initial design. All right, just to walk through the design evolution of this uh, device. Um, our design started off as a sketch, as shown on the right. And this featured control sensors, which included the temperature and humidity actuators, side work ports for the clamps to fit through, and a gas hookup, as well as the entire testing device. Okay. And now on to prototype one. This is our testing box, which was made out of high impact acrylic and aquarium sealant. And we had side ports drilled so that the clamps could fit through them. 
And because, um, because all the components couldn't be fit into a single box, we decided to move the actuators into a separate container. So in contrast to our initial design concept, which held or which would hold the, um, the entire control system, our prototype two um, would have these components spread out and um, would be held by the reservoir, which would hold the testing fluid that would be heated. So this is our current design and I'm going to start with the testing chamber which will include the clamps because testing, tensile testing needs to be done. The testing chamber will also have a latch to avoid spilling the, the liquid into the very expensive lab equipment that Ohio State has. And as far as the control systems are concerned, what we have right now is a 12 volt battery that's powering a step motor and a load cell so that we can do our own testing here at UMBC to make sure that the clamps are working correctly. As far as the reservoir is concerned, the actuators there are the thermal actuators that heats the water to 37 degrees Celsius and then you've got the water motor which um, pushes water into the environmental control box at a rate of 0.2 liters per second. Next slide please. And fabrication wise, here's just some figures of our product. Figure nine shows the thermal and the water, the water motor, thermal actuator and the water motor. You've got figure 10, which is an overhead view of our assembly. And then figure 11 shows a close up view of our pipe system. Next slide, please. Now budget and fabrication, uh, the control system, for the reservoir, the temperature actuator and the water motor came from the, uh, from the uh, PetSmart. And everything else as far as the body is concerned for the reservoir, that's polycarbonate. And that came from uh, Home Depot. And for the testing chamber, which is acrylic, uh, that came from a website that's, you know, just, a, just E Street Plastics icon. Yes, that's it. And the total cost for the project, uh, ignore the typo, it's actually $180. And I will now pass it to Tyler for the testing methods. All right, so uh, here's our testing plan. Um, we want to ensure that our reservoir can hold uh, fluid and be watertight um, for a time period. Uh, we were thinking of a testing period around 24 hours. Uh, we also want to do clamp testing. So we've actually already sent out um, files for printing uh, at Ohio State of our clamps and they can test how the, uh, the clamps interface with their machine. Um, we're also going to do uh, force and displacement tests here at UMBC. Uh, we're going to test how well we can maintain the environment in the testing chamber that is staying at uh, 37 degrees C um, and keeping the samples hydrated. And we're going to uh, verify that the clamps can hold and test tissue without causing um, damage to the tissue that we don't intend to cause. Next slide. So um, here's some data that was actually collected at Ohio State uh, using their machines about uh, ra rapidly stretching optic nerves. So um, they were testing different uh, strain rates for the testing of the optic nerves and uh, measuring the uh, stress and strain uh, of those samples. So here's some testing that we've done on our project. Um, on the right here is a finite element analysis of our clamps uh, measuring uh, the stress and displacement. And on the uh, left is the reservoir um, measuring to make sure that they can withstand the water pressure uh, within the, the chamber. Next slide. So uh, here's a test that we actually completed using our uh, load cell and our clamps to make sure that they can stand up to the amount of forces that are present during the tensile test. So uh, we managed to load it up to about uh, three kilograms uh, and that could have gone <laughs> possibly higher but uh, it's more than enough to test uh, the delicate tissues that we plan on uh, using. And then here is us testing our um, testing chamber itself shown above and the reservoir shown below um, to make sure that they can actually retain the liquid uh, inside. So uh, here's our project timeline. Um, we split it up into four main phases. Uh, the first is just our research and, and uh, early preliminary design, develop, developing the product, um, redesigning and testing after we 
uh, obtain some validation results. And then finalizing our design is our current uh, steps. Uh, so uh, thank you all. And uh, are there any questions? Can you give us a little more detail on your clamps and what you did through there? Yeah, do uh, you want to scroll back to the, um, the clamp slide if you want? So the clamps are actually um, designed to be compliant clamps. So they um, use a thread uh, that forces down a collar on the sort of jaws of the clamp. And you'll be able to see that in more detail uh, with our uh, physical product. Um, but the deformation of the clamp is like carefully designed for so that it deforms without actually uh, breaking and applies even pressure around um, what we're testing. What we plan to test is optic nerves. So they're you know, cylindrical and we want to apply even pressure all the way around the sample. What material are the clamps made out of? Uh, these are made out of uh, 3D printed um, PLA. Um, that was a good candidate because it deforms quite a bit and can be made to be uh, like <laughs> a wide array of uh, like compliance or stiffness. Um, so we're able to control that and uh, make it so that the clamps deform without uh, like breaking or uh, fracturing. Uh, we did have a question. Um, oh, this is what I get for. There we go. And this is from uh, Richard Wright from Lockheed Martin. How did you maintain the constant 37 degrees? Yeah, uh, the heater that we use is um, we're not we, the heater that we're using the submersible Aquion heater. It only only goes up to 88 degrees for now, but. As far as how it maintains that um, maintains that uh, temperature, that's that's how it's advertised to do. It's supposed to be submerged in an aquarium, and it's uh, it's supposed to be submerged in an aquarium, and um, it'll heat up to its target temperature. And once the device the device will actually uh, the device will actually detect whether the the target temperature has been has been um, has been hit, and once the target temperature has been hit, the device actually turns off, and it'll maintain that temperature. And does the system need to be in a controlled environment as well? Uh, well, the testing chamber and the reservoir system is the testing environment. So, uh, yeah, can can you clarify the question, please? The that's what he asked. I don't have a, uh, oh, does, a yes. it, okay. does it, does a system need to be in a controlled environment, like an actual control oh, environment, no, the system no, itself? No, 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 Yeah. Different. Because okay. it's submerged in water and water is very easy okay. to control. That's the, that's the answer. Look for. All right. Congratulations on your final presentation. <laughs> Groups, go to the atrium, quickly set up. We will join you in seven minutes if possible. Tables out there. Alex is there. Get your stuff ready. And please join us back at 1 o'clock for the afternoon presentations. And if you're here, you can also go to the atrium to see products.
be starting in five minutes. We're waiting for our judges to head down from lunch. So a couple quick things to my seniors this afternoon. Uh, first, there are microphones for everybody. Okay, and then the judges will have microphones as well. First group, who's first up? Can you stand up for a second? Because we're going to have you. All right, it is one o'clock. And one thing I did wanna, I'll, I'll give a shout out to them in just a second. So good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for joining us online as well as in person. And we are now getting into our second round of senior capstone presentations. These are students who spent about four, 15 weeks uh, working with a real client 
and to actually solve and create a solution for their their problem. So this is an authentic experience. We are incredibly proud of our seniors. So can we please give them a round of applause? It is not an easy task, and they have spent a lot of hours working on this, so we do want to give them all the celebration and respect today. Uh, one thing is that we do have our, uh, our judging panel here, who are from various companies, federal and otherwise, that are here to ask questions, so they will be asking questions right after the presenters have finished. I am Dr. Jamie Garganis. I am their capstone professor. Uh, it is my privilege and honor that I get to be able to be a part of this experience and watch them through their journey. And uh, we also actually this semester did something new. We actually have system engineers who are here um, representing. Do you want to say hi? Hi. <laughs> who are actually also from industry, who've actually been able to manage uh, each of our different various groups. So we're excited to have them as well. All right. Uh, and we are actually a little ahead. So I feel like I probably would love to get started. Obviously, Alex is not back yet either. Okay, that's right. Oh, there you go. Oh, never mind. No. <laughs> Fooled me. That's not Alex. <laughs> Alex, okay. So, are you ready? You good? Okay. All right. Uh, well, since we are ready to go, we have all of our judges. Are my judges ready? Are you well caffeinated and fed? They might go to sleep. It's possible. This is what happens when you have them after lunch. All right. So without further ado, I will start with our group of, the, of this afternoon, which comes from our volunteer medical engineering group and Michaela Stuhl. Come on out. Do you have your microphones? Yep. Okay, perfect. All right. And you got your thing? All right. Thanks. Thanks, guys. <laughs> Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to our final presentation. We are Michaela Stuhl. We are sponsored by Volunteers for Medical Engineering, also known as VME. I'm Abby Pugh. I'm Chisner Mubo. I'm Ali Wagner. I'm Danielle Roten. So this is our client, Michaela. She suffers from postural orthostatic tachycardia syndrome, also known as POTS, and secondary adrenal insufficiency. Together, these combined to induce weakness, fatigue, and slurred speech, but also induce fainting spells, which is what our product aims to help. So our product is a custom stool that she can take with her. Her job requires her to walk around a lot, and usually she has to sit on the ground. So this is, gives her somewhere to sit, and it also can carry her things. The key features that we focused on were making sure that it was durable and stable, that it locked in a safe position, and that it was easy to carry, and we accomplished this by adding handles and wheels. We also wanted to make sure that it had a quick accessibility time, since she has about a 30 to 60 second window before she passes out. So for our key system requirements, we wanted to make sure that the device weighed no more than 25 pounds. This is taken from a rough estimate of a child's car seat, which she has had to carry around for years since she has two young children. We also wanted to make sure that the stool fit her height. She is 4'10", and so we chose a 28-inch handle for her comfort. We also made sure that the seat was no higher than 14 inches, which is a requirement that we agreed upon with Michaela herself. And then we made sure that the material was weather resistant and also a neutral pattern to fit into her work day. We also wanted to make sure that the stool could be deployed in her 30 second window and our stool actually deploys in less than 12 seconds. So the evolution of our product began with us making prototype one out of cardboard and then we transported that onto CAD to make our preliminary design to then make our prototype two and we changed the seat and the legs to increase thickness to match our next slide which has our finite element analysis for str where stress and displacement and strain is very minimal so Michaela will experience no deflection in her seat. And that's the strain results. <laughs> All right, so now onto the construction phase of our design. So once we had everything and all of our ideas together, we decided to take that to the process of sheet metal bending, specifically the material aluminum 5052H32, as is relatively lightweight, durable, and water resistant, and easily bendable. And so in figure eight, you can see we have different pieces all together, as they each had to be bent separately, and then welded together, as shown in figure nine all except for the top piece, which was attached by hinges. This way, Michaela can open it up and store her belongings inside instead of having to carry extra items in addition to rolling around our products. And then finally, in figure 10, the seat and the legs are also attached. These are also made out of the aluminum, and we also included our handle and wheels, which we ordered off of Amazon. The handle is extendable and collapsible to whatever height Michaela prefers. 
And the wheels have a built-in safety feature. So when you tilt the suitcase back, the wheels touch the ground, letting you roll. If it is standing up like it is now, it's stationary. Only the pegs touch the ground, keeping it in place for Michaela when she sits down. And then here's some pictures from our building process. So in figure 11, we're adding the wheels to our base design. One problem with our wheels was that they swivel. This meant when you would go to roll the stool, the wheels would turn into the base, which presented a problem in the ease of transportability. To counteract this issue, the welder added additional bars on each side of the peg of the wheel assembly to keep it straight. And then in figure 12, you can see the seat and the legs are also attached. However, with the seat, there is a gap between it and the base due to how we attached it. This meant when you put force onto the seat that it would bend a little bit farther than was desired. And also at this point, there's no locking mechanism included. This meant that the legs could go farther out or they could collapse inward unexpectedly, which both presented safety concerns. And so to counteract these issues, we added a plate on top of the seat, which extended the length of the seat as well farther up. So when it would deploy, it would rest on the lip of the base. This kept the seat right where it needed to be. And then we added a locking mechanism. So the bar is attached on the outside. And then when you sit down or when you're deploying it, you can pull it down. It has a slot on the end, which can rest over a support bolt found on the inside of the leg. This kept the legs at a fixed distance from the base, uh, making Michaela safe when she sits down. And then in figure 13 is our final assembly. It is now black, which we accomplished that by spraying it with a rubber spray, specifically a truck bed liner. This way it would soften the rough edges as well as any corners of the metal. And then we added a vinyl strap through the handle. This way Michaela wouldn't have to bend down as far to pull the stool out. And also it would allow her to avoid having to pinch her fingers when trying to tuck the legs up or push the seat down into the base. Okay, Danielle will showcase how our product works. As you can see right now, she is pulling out on the gray strap. That helps to prevent any pinching of the fingers. And when she does that, the legs come down in the front. And she's moving down the locking mechanism, as you see at the side, putting it into place. And at the back, there is a handle and two, uh, two wheels at the bottom. And that's for ease in transporting things. And then, of course, there is a storage compartment where anyone can put their personal belongings. Okay, so with our final product, we tested it with seven different tests. Our first one was to see how much the product weighed. Then we, went, we moved on to how much the product could withstand with weight. We also did a stopwatch to see how long it would take to de deploy because Michaela, of course, she's susceptible to fainting, so we wanted to make sure it deployed in a good amount of time. We moved on to ensuring that our dimensions were the same that we started with. We also tested for water resistancy and also the wheels to make sure they are, they're able to be transported on any type of surface. And of course, we met with Michaela this past Monday to see if she liked the product. Okay, so I'm just gonna read only two from each slide, but uh, thankfully this product only weighs 25 pounds max. It also, it, comes up to 28 inches, which is the right size for Michaela. And then, of course, this can withstand a load of 200 pounds, so Michaela and pretty much anyone can sit on it. And it deploys within 11.42 seconds, so we're good, and we're under the one minute time frame. And so for our budget, we were given $700, 200 from the school and 500 from VME. Out of that, we spent around $185, most on items that we used, some of it on that we didn't during the construction process as different problems arose. And then we had lots of donated materials and time and skills, including the machinist who bent the metal for us, the welder, and the seamstress who sewed our strap, giving us about $516 remaining. So our final timeline, this is our final presentation. And then until up to May 18th, we're gonna be improving on any other uh, spots that we need to change for our stool. Then on May 18th, we're meeting with our professor and our client to show them how the product works and send it off with Michaela. And then up until May 23rd, we're gonna be submitting all documents. And finally, I just wanna thank everyone that helped us throughout this process, from the construction to the support level, and of course, VME for sponsoring us. And then thank you for your time. Yeah. <laughs> I was just going to ask one uh, question. You decided fairly early on 
that you were going to go with aluminum as the construction. Uh, were any other materials thought to be plausible? Yeah, so I'll take that question. That's a great question. We actually had many thoughts about how we build this stool at the very beginning. At first, when you take a look around different chairs, like foldable, collapsible chairs you see everywhere, they're normally made of some kind of plastic. Um, so we did think about the 3D printing or some kind of injection molding, but due to the size of the stool and the time frame that we had, we didn't think it would be uh, the most accurate and reliable method. We also thought about wood, but wood's so much heavier. And so we went the route of aluminum instead of steel, of course, which steel is also heavier. Um, in the future, if this was to be made more like commercial or if we worked with a commercial company to process it, we'd use a heavier plastic so it would be even lighter than what it is now. Any other I've got to ask then if no one else is. Um, I seem to recall there were other things on the market for maybe elderly people, like small. I wouldn't call it a stool, but a small chair that was collapsible. Yes. Was that ever considered, or had she ever entertained that as an option? Yes. So um, we yeah. actually, Michaela, when we first got this project, sent us a picture of a stool that is on the market. Kind of mm -hmm. looked like a walker with a stool that you flip down. Um, she showed it to us, but she said she didn't want it because it didn't really have a backrest, and she didn't like the size of it and how tall it stood. We also looked at other ones that are used in like sports or musicians or um, this fun plastic colorful one, but none of them seemed to have the backrest that she wanted or the support that she wanted. And we also wanted to incorporate some storage, which is why we took inspiration from a suitcase and she just loved how she could wheel it around. This can combine the purse idea with the suitcase. So now that she doesn't have to carry a stool and a purse. Yeah. Thank you. Michaela's online and she said thank you very much and she was very proud of everything you've done. So I just wanted to convey that message. So congratulations on your final presentation. Let's give them a round of applause. All right. And then our next group is also our second VME group, which is dealing with Tyson's bike. You may come in now. Thank you so much. You're so welcome. Hmm? Hi, we're Tyson's pit crew, and uh, we're working with volunteers for medical engineering as well. And we will be taking you through the creation of Tyson's bicycle. I'm Kelly, and we have Albert, Matt, and Israel. So as you can probably tell from our title, uh, our client is eight-year-old Tyson, and he has two conditions. One of them is called tetralogy of Fallot, which means that his, his blood does not carry enough oxygen. The other one is phocomelia of the right leg, which means that he was born without the majority of his right leg. He wants to be able to ride a bike with his sister, so he requested a hand crank bike that looks as close to a regular bike as possible. So with this hand crank bike, uh, we wanted to design it with uh, no, no propulsion using his legs. Uh, it also needs to be safe, so we are including a helmet with it when we present it, and it will also have training wheels attached to it. It's also going to be following the standards outlined by the U.S. Product, Consumer Product Safety Commission. And of course, it must look cool because he is eight. Um, so it's going to have a black and yellow color scheme and he's going to be able to decorate it with vinyl Spider-Man stickers. All right, so as with many of these projects, we had multiple stages of prototyping. Uh, the one that you see up on the screen is our first prototype. Now, what we did for this one is we tried to mimic a regular bike as much as possible by using rear wheel steering and front wheel, uh, I'm sorry, rear wheel power, front wheel steering. Now, we very quickly realized this was very complicated. We'd need to use a multiple chain system and we need to somehow detach the front wheel from the hand crank because I don't know if you can see, but if you tried to turn that, it would throw the chain off completely. Um, now, again, part of the issues was that the cable, the brake cable was in the way of the hand crank, which caused some problems, and the footrest for steering was very thin and not strong enough. Uh, the idea that we went with initially was a linkage system, but again. So 
with the second prototype, we improved very heavily thanks to lots of advice from both VME and from our advisors. Um, we added a sprocket for tension and we decided to move the, the power to the front wheel as well as the steering because that would simplify a whole lot in the process. It would use only one chain and we can control that a lot better. Uh, part of the issue was in this prototype we had no handbrake, only a coaster brake, which introduced some chain tension issues, uh, but that was resolved in the final prototype. Now, we tried disc brakes because we heard from many people that they were mo very reliable. However, there aren't really any kids bike frames that help with mounting disc brakes, so we did not end up going with that. For our final prototype, we welded up all the parts and we converted a standard handbrake into a foot brake. Um, we removed the coaster brakes as mentioned, so the only brake on the bike is this foot brake and we'll perform testing to make sure that that is strong enough. The hand crank, um, initially we wanted to have a rowing motion because we are combining the cranking and the steering with the same system, so it would be complicated for him to sort of try to steer with his right and left hands in different positions. Um, we ran into some manufacturing difficulties with that that we're still trying to work out. In the coming weeks, we're going to add a chain guard, perform final testing, paint and decorate the bike, and add a pannier basket to the back of the bike for storage. And all of these final changes still keep us well under budget. These are some pictures of our current design. On the left side, you can see we have our training wheels on the back of the bike. We have a seat with a seat back. And below the seat, you can see the foot rest. That is for his... Um, when he receives a prosthetic, he will be able to keep his, um, his right leg and the prosthetic up on the bike. On the left side of the bike, in the right photo, you can see the brake um, that will be connected via a cable to the rear wheel where there is a caliper brake mounted to the wheel. Um, also on the front of the bike, you can see the sprockets, one mounted on the hand crank, one mounted on the wheel. And in between there, there is a custom part that we manufactured to route the chain up and away from the bike frame because we found that keeping the chain too close to the frame resulted in a very poor steering uh, turning radius and issues where it would contact the frame. So some of the custom parts that we included in the manufacturing of our bike, this is a footrest that we did the FAA analysis on. The Actual loading that we expected Tyson to produce on the bike, he weighs 50 pounds himself, and then his max push force when we measured it was around 20 pounds. So this is with a load of 100 pounds because 50 pounds passed very clearly and we wanted to increase the load with testing to see if higher loads would also pass the test. So the deformation of the footrest itself was only 0.4 millimeters, which is close to negligible in this case, and the max stress experienced was 144 MPA, with the yield strength of the steel material we used being 460 MPA, which is almost a factor of safety of three, which gives us plenty of room. And when tested at higher loads of 200 pounds, it still took more than 200 pounds for yielding to occur, which is well beyond what we expect Tyson to be able to produce. Then this is the L bracket that we are attaching to the steering column on the front of the bike to route the chain away from the bike frame to allow for better steering. And the amount of force when we did the calculations, the load required that would be put onto the pins fit into this bracket is around five pound inches. So it's very low, so the deformation is eight thousandths of a millimeter, which is, again, very, uh, negligible. And then the max stress experienced by this part in particular was only 22 MPA, which is very low in comparison to the yield strength. And then finally, we're going into the final touches on the bike. So we're adding the chain guard mentioned earlier. It will likely be made out of a plastic that we can uh, form with heat. It will be easier to manufacture that way. We are attaching a pannier basket to the back of the bike for extra storage for crutches in case he wants to carry them. We have final testing in accordance with the guidelines that we are given. We will be adding different loads to different parts of the bike to test structural integrity. Uh, we will have a braking test to test the braking distance. And we 
will be painting and decorating it in the black and yellow color, screen, color scheme that was given to us. And final checks will be taken into account with VME. And then we have the final demo with our professor, Dr. Gerganis, and finally the delivery to Tyson. Any questions? We don't know that yet. Um, our bike is currently not um, complete enough to begin that kind of testing. But our target is anywhere between 10 up to 15 miles per hour. So to go along with that question, um, have you evaluated you know, how much force he's able to apply on those handles when he's trying to move the bike? And have you tested? him and made sure that you designed um, that chain mechanism to be able to operate within his capacity? Yes, yeah. so we, we just manufactured this um, the other day, so we haven't had a chance to test it with him or measure the amount of torque that it takes to turn the wheel, but we did perform some testing by ourselves and we found that um, getting up to speed was no problem. Um, so it's about a two to one gear ratio. Um, so. There's, there's enough torque to turn the wheel. Yeah. And if I can add to that, we, we met with Tyson during a VME brunch and we were able to measure about how much he's able to push uh, using a basic kitchen scale and just having him push against it, uh, against the wall. We got about 20 pounds. We got about 20 pounds worth of force from him, which uh, we determined would be more than enough to turn the bike. We'll go more into the details uh, in our final testing but we, we believe he can absolutely turn the bike. And following up on that, it might be, is there any opportunity for gearing of a system to provide extra torque? Uh, ideally, yes. So because this bike uses mostly standard bike parts, uh, if they wanted to change out the gears, they absolutely could. Uh, the current hand crank that we're using has a, an exchangeable gear. Um, I believe it's mounted, I want to say on, on a like, hex screw type thing. And they can change it out whenever they want. Uh, the wheel itself also has a gear that they can change out if they would like to, uh, to any size cassette ideally. So the gear ratios are absolutely changeable. So um, just to follow up on my previous question. So I know you're saying that you will test it out, but you know, if you know how much he's able to push, and that pulley system you have, um, of course you have the, the dimensions of it, you know, you know his weight, you know the weight of the bike, you should be able to predetermine and calculate what is the minimum force required to move that bike, have you done that analysis? You don't need the actual prototype to, to test that, you could at least have the theoretical number before. Yeah, yeah, it's true, we, we neglected to do that. Can we give them a round of applause? <laughs> Congratulations on your final presentation. Thank you very much. All right. Our next team is with one of our faculty members here at UMBC, Dr. Gual, and they're going to be presenting on their swirling pendulum. So team, come on out when you are ready. They're giving each other congratulations back there, so it's really kind of sweet. So. <laughs> Hello, my name is Jad Abisaleh, and with me are Darius Adams, Tyler Autry, and Eric Sneviat, and we are Team 12 Swirling Pendulum. Our client is Dr. Ankit Goel, a professor here at UMBC. He has asked us to create a pendulum with two degrees of freedom in both the horizontal and vertical planes. This system was originally designed by Dr. Harish Mudapusi, who now resides in India. Dr. Goel provided us with Dr. Muda Pussy's original design to assist us in creating our, a version of our own. In the future, this system will be used by Dr. Goel's graduate students to continue researching and developing control systems. The functional and performance requirements of our system are listed in the table behind me. 
Our client's main request was for the system to be able to rotate in 360 degrees in both the horizontal and vertical planes, and to be able to record the rotational angles via encoder. Some other requirements were for the mass to be interchangeable and under 200 grams. This is a safety requirement as exceeding these limits may, excuse me, may cause malfunctions within our system. It was also important to our client to keep the system within a boundary of one cubic foot. So in our first prototype, it closely resembles the original design from Dr. Mariposi that it gives us a general baseline understanding of how the system moves and what the final result should look like. In between our first and second prototypes, we, we learned that over half of the parts that were used in the original design were manufactured bespoke, and this is just not a viable option for us due to our timeline and budget. So in our second prototype, we, function, or we focused on simplifying all the parts and only having what was absolutely necessary to the system. One of the major redesigns was the case around the outside was designed to be easily removable so that we could access the inside parts if anything was to fail. Another redesign was to redesign the assembly underneath the motor chassis for the same reasons, just visibility and ease of use to get to. And the final redesign was instead of screwing in the two arms on the bottom next to the mass from behind, we used a 90 degree fitting with threading. Into our third and final prototype, we, uh, we encountered some problems with our second. One of the major ones was the case design ended up putting unnecessary stress on the slip ring, which is represented by the cylinder on the back. To mitigate this problem, we used two pillow ball bearings screwed onto a wooden frame so that none of the components would interact with uh, the wall or anything else. Another redesign was to put an acrylic case around the assembly underneath the motor chassis to improve safety of the user in case anything was to malfunction. And finally, the last redesign was for a similar reason, due to safety of the user, we got rid of the 90 degree fitting and chose to have one solid bar bent to 90 degrees. So here we have the motion analysis of our system. Um, as you can see here, there is um, free motion on the horizontal and vertical axes of the ball bearing <coughs> or of the changeable mass. Here we have the FA analysis of our 90 degree rod with the changeable mass attached to it. On the left we have the stress analysis and on the right we have the displacement analysis. On the left you can see that the stresses on the changeable mass and the rod are minimal while on the right the most displacement is on the changeable mass. Here we have the motor chassis um, part and the, excuse me, and the static displacement um, from the FEA analysis. We, had, we did a five Newton force load on the bottom of the motor chassis to simulate the changeable mass and the attached equipment. Um, the displacement from that five Newtons was 6.5 nanometers. For the fabrication and testing of the system, the group had to first allow for parts to arrive, and then once these parts arrived, they had to be assembled and put together in accordance to Prototype 3's CAD model. And we decided that some of the functional requirements would be tested using measurement and weight. Other performance requirements would be verified using uh, a physical demonstration, and the physical demonstration would verify that the the physical demonstration will verify that the system is wired correctly, the, a sinusoidal voltage is applied to the system, and that the two encoders can de determine the angles of the two shafts. Here's the budget analysis of the components that we ordered. Uh, several related issues include uh, cost of parts, because from the initial parts list, some of the parts were just very expensive, as well as ordering complications. The group, we ordered four different motors, and they were either unavailable or they weren't able to be shipped to the university. Another related issue includes non-recovery expenses. During the first wave of ordering parts, we ordered a 90 degree fitting and later on the design changed and we no longer required the fitting. 
The project timeline for this semester can be broken down into five main phases. The first phase would be the project initiation. Here is where we created the, our engineering notebook initially, as well as getting in contact with the, the client and determining the necessary system requirements. The second phase was to finalize the concept design. Here we just wanted to get a valid approach to how we're gonna attack the problem from Dr. Gold, as well as understanding rotating pendulum design and the inputs and outputs of the system. The third phase was pre-production pre -production prototypes. Here we developed and analyzed prototypes one and two, as well as getting an initial parts list. The, the fourth phase was production prototype. This is the production of prototype three, and this is the current phase that we're in. In this phase, we developed a, an effective cost analysis, as well as purchasing parts and assembly. The fifth and final phase of the project in our timeline would be final adjustments and testing. Here we would do last minute troubleshooting and problem solving, as well as breadboard wiring and final, final documentation for the project. In this fifth phase, we want to achieve the, the goal given to us by Dr. Gold to create a two degree of freedom swirling pendulum in order for Dr. Gold to use in his uh, advanced level graduate level course. Thank you all for your time. Any questions? I have a simple question in reference to your FEA analysis. Uh, it appeared that you just took the mass of the certain components and did a static calculation. If I'm mistaken, correct me, but uh, this is a moving dynamic device and I'm assuming that that mass that's being thrown, it, it will be thrown around it'll experience some acceleration. Uh, were you given any parameters as to what the maximum acceleration would be and therefore what maybe the FEA analysis should have been done with? So the maximum torque of our motor is 8.3 uh, Newton centimeters, which when we applied the torque to the uh, system, it produced those FEA analysis. Like, so just to add on to that as well, so for example, you know, you have the motors and you have the setup and there's weights associated with that and then of course the swinging pendulum itself and the ball at the end also there's weight associated with that. So as that moves in a 3D motion, of course, there's going to be moments applied to the various joints within the system. Have you thought about, examined what is that um, and is there going to be any damage or where, is that going to wear out your joints at the motors and at the virus um, fittings within the system? Have you evaluated that and seen what's the max allowed? Um, actually, we haven't. I think looking forward, we should consider that. Can we give them a round of applause? Congratulations on your final presentation. You can head back. All right, and our next group is uh, actually working with Dr. Tobolesky, our faculty member here, doing uh, redeveloping a whole tensile testing control system. And they're coming out. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Harris Ejes. My name is Ethan McBurrows. I'm Sean Mahmoud. I'm Varun Vivekanandan. And we are the Pasco Pals. So our system engineer is Randy Justin, and our project supervisor are Dr. Jamie Gerganis, Alex, and Emily. So our client for the project is Dr. Tim Topleski. He's a professor at University of Maryland, Baltimore County. Mainly teaches uh, material sciences. So the goal of our project is to Motorize the hand crank component of the PASCO tensile testing machine, which we use in the materials lab for tension and shear test. So the whole purpose of this 
So the whole purpose of this lab, uh, is of this project, is to get more accurate results caused by the inconsistent rotational speed. So after our initial meeting with our client, we list, we assemble a list of system requirement. As you can see on the screen, some of the major requirements consist of that our design should be an attachment rather than a permanent fixture so that they could always go back and compare the result with, with the hand crank and motorized data. So uh, our design should also be able to, should be strong enough to test the strongest material, which is AI SI1018 steel specimen. Our design should also be able to uh, perform multiple tests. Our design should be able to allow our users to uh, select the intended testing mode and select the speed parameters. Now, in order to accomplish this task, the team has designed a stepper motor driven chain linkage utilizing two sprockets, um, one connected to the uh, spine of the MTS machine and the other sprocket being connected to the stepper motor. The team also, the design also utilizes the Arduino platform in order to allow users to select their desired testing speed. And currently, the design, um, the direction of the motor can be changed using the, using a dip switch on the stepper driver, where the clockwise setting is used for tension tests and the counterclockwise setting is used for shear testing. Some of the uh, important components of this design include a high torque stepper motor, a stepper driver, a 48 volt power supply, an Arduino Mega 2560 R3 controller, two 25 tooth sprockets, one measuring 10 millimeters and the other measuring 14 millimeters, and finally a quarter inch roller chain. Now for our first prototype, it served as a proof of concept. Um, this prototype was constructed using VEX components and two key requirements that were fulfilled by this prototype were both speed selection as well as clockwise and counterclockwise oscillations. A key takeaway of this prototype were some of the vibration issues that erupts whenever the motor is ran at speeds higher than 100 RPM. Our second prototype was constructed using our final components, including a custom Arduino user interface. This prototype also demonstrated speed selection, and this prototype was important in order to allow the team to better understand how to assemble a hot torque stepper motor. Now this slide are both a diametric and right view of our scale CAD model. It's important to note that the wood base serves as a method to raise the height of the MTS machine in order to match the height of the stepper motor so that both components can be linked using a chain. On the right view, you will see all of our electrical components, including our power supply, microcontroller, and stepper driver. All of these components are housed under a plastic enclosure, and it's important to note that both the power supply and Arduino are exposed in order to allow the user to plug the design into a wall outlet as well as connect a laptop in order to run the custom Arduino user interface. Now our current model, um, the purpose of the motor is connected and secured to the wood base using four uh, threaded rods as well as two wooden supports. And this current model is capable of both tension and shear testing. Uh, as an extra precaution, the MTS machine was secured to the wood using screws. Here's our fabrication plan. Um, the ones you see over here, the bullet points that are checked off are the ones that we've already done. Initially, we assembled the motor and its components. Uh, the one problem we, had, we ran into when assembling the motor was the motor was a little taller than the uh, Pasco machine. So we got over the problem by adding wood blocks underneath the Pasco machine and raised it up. So if you need any carpentry work done, it's the Pasco pals you're looking for. <laughs> so after that, after we got the height settled down, we sized our chains and uh, screwed our motors and our components into the board. Uh, over the next few weeks, we will focus on safety. We'll add a plexiglass enclosure in front of our uh, chain. For our motor performance and our testing, uh, we made sure that our motor is capable of doing uh, 1 to 100 RPM. We tested 360 brass for both shear and tension, and it performed as expected. They, all, they were all broken. Our motor is really strong. Um, the strongest material being provided to us is uh, AISI 1018 steel, and we'll be testing that in the next few weeks. All the results will be compared to the hand crank values given by Dr. T, and they'll all be compared to the Z-value test. Here you see our build of materials, and you can see that we spent a bit of our budget on mostly 
our motorized components, and we spent a little over $400 in our project. So you're about to see two simulations of our project. The first is going to be a shear test on 360 brass. And the second video is a tension test on 360 brass as well. And here are the results of those simulations. As you can see in figure 14, we have the broken tangile specimen of 360 brass. And then in figure 15, we have the broken shear specimen uh, that's 360 brass. Here's our full timeline for the project. From the 8th of February to the 20th of February, we did our initial client consultation with Dr. Topoleski. And then we assembled a system artifacts document, which includes our functional block diagram, our system boundary diagram, and our mission scenario diagram. From the 23rd of February to the 3rd of March, we assembled a bullet list of all our system requirements. And then we did a work breakdown structure and Gantt chart. From the 4th of March to the 18th of March, we completed our first prototype, which was our VEX approximation of our system, and then we assembled a full system requirement specification draft. From the 20th of March to the 2nd of April, we completed our second prototype, which was our performance test of our motor. From the 17th of April to the 5th of May, we, did our fabric we began our fabrication phase, which included cutting the boards and stacking them and screwing components in. From the 2nd of May to the 14th of May, um, we finished our fabrication phase and we conducted a few uh, preliminary tests in tension and shear as you saw earlier and then we gave our final presentation today and then from the 15th of May to the 24th of May uh, we're going to be doing some more uh, testing and data analysis in tension, shear and fatigue and then we're going to be doing some final deliverables, our final report, our project poster and video and our verification and validation document. Uh, we're also going to be sharing our design portfolio with our supervisors and client and giving a product demo. Thank you. Any questions? I'll take that. Um, so are, are you asking, uh, sorry. So for the materials that you guys are looking at, you said that you had, a, you had a range of different materials you were testing. Did you calculate like max load needed to break them and then calculate the system requirements for that? Yes, we did. So initially we used a torque wrench to measure the, uh, the strongest material, like I said, was 1018 steel. And we used a torque wrench to measure what torque it takes to, measure, to break that steel. And it was about uh, 10 foot pounds. And that's how we calculate. We went out with our motor. And our motor is 12 to uh, 10 foot pounds, a little over 10 foot pounds, too. Okay. Were there requirements of the motor and or the apparatus to provide a certain strain rate, not just force to break something? And then also, if there were any idea or concept of varying the rate of the apparatus, um, is there any sort of control for the speed of the drive, or is it just on and off? No, our motor can definitely be controlled. Uh, we're using the Arduino to control it, and it can be set from anywhere from 1 to 100 RPM. But um, the, st the strain rate, anything about that, we haven't got that far into calculations. But So I'm not aware of that answer right now, but I'll find out and get back to you. I, I do have one. So, um, of course, so when you have the motor running and then you are you know, doing your tensile test, right? Of course, I know you can monitor the RPMs uh, maybe through Arduino, but um, how you basically the data in terms of just how much force, you know, you're applying onto that um, testing uh, specimen to break it, how are you measuring that and then how are you making that accessible to the user? We have the software called Apasco, so that, that's totally separate from our Arduino. That's where we actually test the, all the strengths, all the shear stress and your attention. Congratulations on your final presentation. Give them a round of applause. Good job, guys. Our next team is also sponsored by a faculty member here, Dr. Joe Washington, and they will be presenting on the bicycle trainer. So. Come on out.
Hi, my name is Victor Hadabanjo. Dimitri Hadziak. Devinis Mataba. Jeffrey Young, and we're moving still. So the objective of our project was to create an indoor bike trainer that can simulate, that can change the front gradient of the, the front axle and simulate riding outdoors with a personal bike. Our customers included Dr. Joseph Washington, who was our client, and he teaches here at UMBC, and cyclists of any kind who want to use a personal bike indoors, maybe when the weather's not ideal. Some system requirements is that the maximum gradient is 18%, the minimum is negative 10%. We are able to adjust the gradient levels with an accuracy of plus or minus 5%. That the user the responds to the inputs, responds with a maximum of 100 milliseconds, and that the system can run for five hours without an eruption. Another system requirement is that it connect, connect to the bike, which is called a domain AL4 disc trek bike. The system has to weigh less than 20 pounds, not exceed two feet in any one direction and it must be able to support the user weight of 200 pounds. Safety was a priority in our design to minimize any potential risk. Our initial system design sketch used a linear actuator to adjust the gradient level of the front axle of the bike and a Zwift hub to adjust the resistance of the bike pedal to simulate a realistic bike riding experience. This is our final design. On the left side is our handle attachment, which displays and adjusts the gradient percentage. And on the right side is our complete system. The first thing our team did was to use the wheelbase dimensions to determine the stroke length needed for the linear actuator. And by doing this, we combined our two equations and we applied our target grade range as well as our wheelbase dimension to determine that we needed a stroke length of 30 centimeters. So by having a 3D CADD model for our first prototype, we were, in, we were able to um, simulate the movement of each component and we determined that the linear actuator came in contact with our one and a half inch PVC pipe that we were originally uh, planning on using. Um, so we determined by doing, um, having it 3D designed, we were able to determine that we need to increase the size of the rigid PVC pipe. Here is our uh, electrical components. We use the time of flight sensor in order to figure out the, the distance um, to the, or figure out the change in position of the linear actuator. We also originally just wanted to automate the control of the system using our Zwift hub. Uh, in order to do that, we needed a motor driver and a, a step-down voltage regulator, but eventually we figured out that we weren't able to, um, to do this, so we got rid of those two components. This is how the whole system is, is wired. Um, the 14-gauge wire, um, wire is used for our 12-volt uh, wiring to the linear actuator, and then we step that down using Molex connectors to 18-gauge uh, fe uh, female to female wire connectors for the electrical components. The reason why we chose to use rigid PVC pipe is it has a high tensile strength. Um, it also allowed us to move the connection point of the top of the linear actuator downwards. Um, and then um, we also decided to use a 2020 aluminum V-slot extrusion as well as a gantry kit and a custom clamp. Pictured here on the left is our support system. We weren't sure about where we wanted to have the location of the through axle, which connects to the bike. Originally, we had it on the outside, but we moved it um, inside. So for our first physical prototype, we use a two inch PVC pipe clamp um, to do some physical testing. Since we've uploaded these slides, we've 3D printed our components box. So now, but when we did the, the prototypes, we used Legos in order to be able to make fine adjustments um, in order to uh, get proper placement for our, all of our electrical components. Here's a bottom right view of our prototype one. At first, we wanted to, uh, for complex, uh, simple, um, and low cost, we made uh, the base out of wood. Um, it was uh, durable and able to get the job done, ease, ease of use. 
Um, here's, at first, creating the clamp um, is where all the stress is concentrated. We wanted to make sure that the, the clamp was able to withstand all the stresses, and so at first we wanted to make the clamp out of 6061 aluminum. But due to complexity in manufacturing this, we decided to go with uh, printing this out of uh, PLA, and we felt confident in this as the yield strength of this was 10, to, 10 times stronger than the stress, the max stress that we'll, we'll have on our system. So some things that we learned from prototype two was that the Zwift app isn't, doesn't like to speak to any other uh, third party systems. Um, so originally we wanted to use a man in the middle technique which would be able to transfer speed and power data from the STMS, FTMS um, to our microcontroller but doing all the code and um, we just had a lot of issues with that. So our client was more than willing to have a manual operation. So in order to do this, we um, used a rocker switch and an OLED screen to uh, display to the users what the uh, simulated percent gradient of the bike was at. Also, since we've uh, uploaded these slides, we've omitted the housing from our final design since we decided to 3D print our, our components box, our electrical components are protected. So this is a picture of our temporary uh, handlebar connection. As you can see, there's a rocker switch and on the screen it is presented at negative 2%, which will show our results later for that. Since safety is prioritized, we wanted to make sure that the base was able to rock on front and back to a lot when the actuator is going up and down, and we have a accessory piece to uh, um, that's a eye stabilizer to prevent the um, main base from going side to side. So some of the testing that we've already completed is the gradient capability test, which is just basically that the OLED screen displays the proper range of gradients and does, and does not exceed the limits. The second test we've done is the gradient level accuracy test in which we measure the true gradient as compared to what's outputted on the OLED screen and made sure they are calibrated and the same. Um, the third test is the user input response time test, make sure it responds within 100 milliseconds, and then we weighed the system to make sure it weighs less than 20 pounds. So these are just the results from the previous slide. At its, at its lowest grade, it did display negative 10%. At its highest, it was 18%. It responded within 100 milliseconds. There wasn't any sudden or, or hazardous movements. Um, the system weighed about seven pounds, which is way under the target of two, 20 pounds. And for future testing, we still have to do the load testing, which is basically just putting the client on the bike and make sure it withstands a load of 200 pounds. We also have to do the continuous operation test, which is that it can run for five hours without any interruption. And the domain AL disk compatibility test, to make sure that it connects to the bike easily and disconnects easily for portability. And then the dimensions test to make sure it does not, not exceed two feet in any one direction. This is a breakdown of our budget. Of our, this is a breakdown of most of our expenses. Most of our budget was spent on electrical components while our hardware was mostly outsourced. We had a total budget of $200 and we went a little bit under that with our total cost being $196. So this is our timeline to finish off the project. This table is a little inaccurate as we got the handles earlier than expected and we've already put them on the system. The housing we omitted. Concerning the base, we've already printed the support system and we just need the I-beam stabilizer to prevent any lateral movement. For the, we still have to do all of the physical testing and we still have to complete some final documents that need to be turned into deliverables. And we still haven't scheduled our demo, but we just got our avail availability from our client, which is the 23rd and 24th of May. So we hope to schedule it then. That's it. So um, I think you touched on it a little, little briefly at the end there. So of course, I know you've, you've taken into account the, the loads in terms of just coming from the bike, you know, straight down, but lateral movements, right? When someone's riding that bike, they may be shaking it, uh, you know, there's, that's gonna cause vibrations and, and, and forces at the joints, have you taken that into account, looked at that? With the base? Yes, yeah. Well, we, 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 
Yeah. Um, so we've, we did um, a lot of calculations beforehand to determine, because um, most of the load is just going to be directly on the linear actuator. So that is what we needed to determine what, um, what the load would be. Um, to figure that out, we used um, you know, the weight of the user. Also, we incorporated different gear ratios um, to when they have a certain cadence. Um, so we tested that at, at, or did the calculations for various different um, configurations. And unless he just, in, if he decided to change his gear configurations, we made sure that at the maximum it would it would be able to fit that. And whatever um, we did some power calculations to figure out the force on the pedals as well as on the front axle of the bike. So we did do all those calculations. How is this design different from, say, a Peloton? The, pel the pel Um So our design is different because it allows the, the, um, the user to be able to attach this onto their bike a lot quicker and easier. Um, and it, the price of it is also a lot cheaper. Um, it came out to be about $200 while a Peloton or a Zwift um, their versions are up to seven hundred, eight hundred dollars. May I ask, is a Peloton like a personal? Is that a stationary bike? So this is like he attaches his road bike, like outdoor road bike, to our system. So that it's not like you can use it outside, and then when the weather's bad, you use it inside. Right, takes off the front wheel, attaches it to our system, and then. I think I gave my judges enough food so they're tired. They're not asking all the questions they did this morning. <laughs> so you guys got it good. All right, congratulations on your final presentation. <laughs> our last three groups are in our partnership with Athletics and um, Mr. Kevin Gibson O'Neill is here today. So turn it over to our Tackling Dummies. Good afternoon, everyone. We are Team Dummy. I'm Alex Hardy, and I'm accompanied by Tesfa Worku, Daniel Kahn, and Jackson Carter. Our client is uh, Coach Kevin Gibbons O'Neill, and he is the Assistant Athletic Director here, and he's been here since 2005. He saw the Dartmouth Tackling Dummy, which is an expensive football tackling dummy uh, that is uh, remote controlled, and he wanted to have us create a product for him that would create advancements for the lacrosse team and simulate in-game scenarios. Some of the key requirements for our robot include uh, going above 10 miles per hour, which would be a, about the average speed of a college lacrosse player, to maneuver as a college lacrosse player laterally and forwards, and to uh, not topple over when maneuvering. So there are three concepts that we kept in mind for the basic research and the prototypes for the future, and that is speed, stability, and maneuverability. One of these aspects is zero degree turn, which is having the vehicle turn on its um, turn on an axis that goes through the center of mass. In order to fulfill this, we need to have all the applicants and all the um, circuitry inside the uh, inner compartment be having weight symmetry and go towards the center. Uh, there's a divot inside the chassis. Oh, oh. There's a divot inside the chassis that's wide enough to snug the dummy. And the disadvantages of the whole prototype one is that if it tips over, it can um, hurt the middle motor, motor two, that controls the two wheels. And also, there's a lag time that we suspect that's going to happen, and that is going to hurt the maneuverability of the whole system. Uh, zero, we kept the zero degree radius for prototype two, and we opted for a two wheel system instead of three wheel system. Uh, the two wheel system, only, you only have to control one side to go to the direction that you would want. We added divots for hooks in order for the stable, in order for the um, dummy not to fall off when it's going to max speeds. And it's gonna be supported by four omnidirectional wheels on the side in order for it not to fall off when it's at rest. And also, when it's going and making those sudden movements, it doesn't skid off and make um, it fall down. The changes to be made is material expectations. We had ABS plastic and PLA plastic in mind for these prototypes. However, in prototype three, we opted for wood and plywood design. 
Uh, this is very similar to the last design. You can see the inner compartment where all the circuitry is going to be held. Uh, the tires, motors, batteries, all are going to be in an um, organization so it doesn't um, mess up the center of mass being in the center. Uh, one of the main changes is the top co compartment where the dummies can be held instead of a circular design which would be made in ABS plastic, it's going to be made in wood, therefore the lateral wood pieces. So as Alex mentioned earlier, we want to make sure that the cross dummy goes 10 miles per hour and also want to make sure it runs for a duration of a practice. So we calculate the RPMs, which was, which was around 336, and then to find the torque, we found the force, which was a around 128 newtons. And we found the torque to be around 8.13 newton meters. And then to find the power of the motors, we found the power to be 180 watts. And then we found the current of the motors, which was five amps. And then the current of the battery divided by the current of the motors was about 1.6 hours of runtime. So after performing all necessary calculations, we decided to look for a motor kit that fulfilled all requirements, uh, dealing with torque, power, voltage, runtime, all the good stuff. So the motor kit we found costed $300, and because it was coming from China, we had to expedite the shipping, costed about 91 extra dollars, and so it ran us about $400. So of course it was hard getting extra budget for that, but we were approved of it, and we'd finally chosen the crux of our design. We were ready to put together the plywood, the controller, the motor driver, and this brand new motor kit, and we were super excited to put everything together. Two weeks prior to today's fi uh, final presentation, the motor kit arrived, and like a kid on ch Christmas morning, I finally was excited to open it up and got super excited to put it all together. And what we got was 15 coffee mugs. So the weight kind of balanced out. It was 6.5 kilograms. I was greeted with insane disappointment, but we had to take it in stride. Uh, with one week until our final presentation, we had to keep moving forward and put it all together. So of course, we had to make some adjustments. The first adjustment was replacing the 15 pound tackling dummy with pool noodles. Uh, that saved us about 10 pounds of weight and also could allow us to move away from the plywood durability and hardness, you know, that type of design. So we were allowed to move forward to with, with something else. And that's where our new motor design came into play. So I was really scared, but I took a trip to our local RC hobby shop and found a new motor design. And they pointed me towards an RC frame that went about 30 miles per hour and had three throttle ranges. So it goes from 50%, 75%, and 100%. But we were planning on staying closer to 50% because the average lacrosse player can go about 10 to 15 miles per hour. And so we went forward with this design. Those are the specifications, but I won't bore you with them. And so our fabrication plan went from taking that frame and moving forward with some sort of mount that we 3D modeled and is being 3D printed right now. So it will latch onto either side of the RC frame and the tackling dummy will slot perfectly into place. So this is a closer design on the low mount. Uh, we had to make sure that the mount side pieces are specifically towards the RC mortar kit. And besides that, there's a space, as you can see in the little subsection right there, where the dummies can be held in, and uh, is the crux of the final design for the CAD. FEA analysis, oh God, sorry. So FEA analysis of the dummy, we um, put an 80 pound force on the inner part of the motor plate. Uh, we just suspected that the dummy might have some rain water just in case of the rain. And 80 pounds is much above the, the specified weight of the whole dummy. And it made sure that the minimal displacement and stress of the whole thing. So we were straight with the, with the whole thing. So as originally stated, we tried to buy individual parts. And at the end of the day, it was a lot more expensive, about $77. And then also it caused more stress because some of the wiring and stuff like that, we never had any experience doing that. And buying the motor kit would just make the assembly more uh, easier. And also the compatibility with the ma manufacturers, uh, different manufacturers like uh, some of the parts were from coming to, from different manufacturers and putting together might cause some issues. And then uh, the pool floaties were a lot weighted a lot less than the tackling dummy and then that could cause some durability with the motors putting a lot of strain on it and stuff like that. And then the old design cost around $600 that include the plywood, motor kit, wheels, electronics and batteries and all that good stuff. So the new budget was around $290, just the motor kit and the backup battery and the pool floats. Uh, so we had three tests, the maneuverability test, the sprint test, and the application test. The maneuverability test is just going uh, zigzag and changing direction quickly. The sprint test is just going in a straight line and the application test is just how the lacrosse players go against the dummy pretty much. So, at the end of the day, the timeline. Uh, so we had our finish our prototypes and our presentations. Now we're on our final design. Uh, as Daniel mentioned earlier, 
our 3D print should be done in the next couple of days, and then we can assemble it all, and then test it all next week, and then demonstrate it to Mr. Kevin Givens O'Neill, and then our final documentations are due May 23rd. That's it. So I, I have a question. So of course, I know you, you guys had to adjust and um, purchase an R, you know, your base, right? It's already made and you purchased it. So now I'm just trying to understand. So if this is, once you mount this and you take it outside, is the idea to have someone remote control the dummy or are you building the dummy to be able to function its own? What's, what's the idea there? Yeah, so it's not automated, it's remote controlled. And the main pur purpose was to increase offensive production. So the players wouldn't waste their time guarding the, pl the player who's actually shooting towards the goal. They could control this tackling dummy and that would increase offensive production and also increase the overall speed of practices moving forward. Um, have you, so, um, so I know you did your engineer analysis in terms of just, you know, how much, uh, what you showed earlier was the engineer analysis in terms of just what were the load requirements for the motor if you guys were building the base. But now that you're, of course, you're not doing that, you're adding on the load. Have you thought about, um, you know, when you mount this, uh, the dummy on top of this base and it's moving, uh, there's, of course, there's going to be the center of gravity, but when you start moving left and right forward, uh, depending on the center of the gravity of the dummy, that's going to throw off and cause moments. Have you, have you done any analysis on that to, to figure out, you know, if, if based on the, the max moment caused by the dummy, depending on how fast you're moving, if it's, if it's not going to fall, it's not going to tip over, have you calculated that? Because I haven't seen it, just curious. Yeah, no, so we haven't done any analysis directly on that, but we made the mount, uh, the mount that we're going to be putting on top tall enough for the dummy to be slotted in and, and friction fitted. So we're, uh, like, we're thinking that it won't t tip over, and yeah, that's what we're, like, you know, looking forward to. But yeah, we haven't done any direct analysis on that. How durable are the motors and the wheels? So this gets tackled by 220-pound yeah. man. How is it going to handle yeah, so the dummy isn't designed for any contact. It's supposed to shadow a lacrosse player and play defense on them. So we haven't, I guess, thought of them going fully, you know, tackling it because that's, I don't think lacrosse players do that. Uh, yeah, so uh, we're hoping that, that they won't do that. Um, but the print is fairly simple as well. Um, the RC frame itself is able to hold 30 pounds. So that combined with the fact that the frame is pretty easy to print, if it does break, if it does get tackled, we're assuming it'll be able to take the force and if, the mount does break somehow, they can reprint it because we have the models uh, already laid out for them. So, one more question. What is, just out of the blue, what, um, you know, you know the weight of the dummy, right? What is, what is the required weight of the base to make sure that that doesn't tip over when it's moving left and right? What is like the, yeah. the, the min weight that you have on that base? So, the dummy itself, uh, each pool noodle weighs 0.5 pounds. So we're using nine of them, so it's about 4.5 pounds, I'd say. Um, so we're assuming that's way lighter, obviously, than 15 pounds. And with the mount on top of it, uh, I can go back to point it out to you, but um, on the mount, you see those two tabs uh, on each side? They slot onto the base of the frame, and there's two clips that go through the little divots that are pointing out, and so those will hold the mount in frame. And so the RC frame actually came with a plastic model that went on top that we scalped off. And it weighed just amount, about the same amount that this ABS uh, mount would weigh. So we're assuming that, obviously, with the same mount, it's going to be able to withstand the force and the weight of it. Okay, I'd, I'd just encourage you to, to, draw, to do like FE analysis just on those joints, because it seems like that force is going to be, a lot of the force when it's moving is going to be applied there. Mm -hmm. so just make sure, you know, you, however you mount it, it's able to withstand that force. For sure. Wait, I have to congratulate you. Hold on. Wait. I need to say congratulations. <laughs> I did ask you, though, what are you supposed to do with those mugs? Why didn't you use them in your design? <laughs> oh, congratulations. <laughs> Our second to last team is also uh, developed a product for Kevin Gibson O'Neill, and it's a sports trebuchet. Uh, 
the team, you ready? Come on out. Hi everyone, we are Quick Draw Lax, and this is our final presentation. My name is Jules Perte. I'm Michael Cole. I'm Griffin Wine. I'm Imani Hassel. So just to give you a little background of our product, our customer is Mr. Kevin Gibbons O'Neill, and he wanted us to build a freestanding device so women's lacrosse players will be able to practice on their draw skills individually while having, while having an individual with them. So in the future, that's what this device will be used for. So how women's lacrosse, lacrosse draw works is that two players will stand opposite of each other while the sticks are pushed together with a ball in the middle. They would then go into a lunging, kind of like squatting position and start to push and pull their sticks so the ball will come on one side. So here you have our system requirements. These were also decided with our customer. So the system will be able to withstand a force between zero to 20, 20 pounds of force, which was calculated. And then, we, then the system will not be no more than 50 pounds. And then the system will also be able to withstand outside conditions such as rain, um, rain sleet, and snow. The system will be able to go at multi-speed so each woman can so each woman can work on their um, skills at their own pace. The system will also be able to be operated by a foot pedal and would be portable. So in order to design our product, there is obviously research and data collection that needed to be conducted. We had the ability to go to a women's lacrosse practice. And at that practice, we brought our one-tenth prototype model to them to get their input, as well as having the girls stand there. We were able to see what the average height was that they started to draw to design our product as well as there was no data out there on how much force the woman is pushing their lacrosse stick against the other lacrosse stick. So I held a scale against me and a plate underneath it to balance the weight and had them press against it, which is where we got that zero to 20 pounds. And then as well as you'll see later, we used bungee cords. We decided to use different variety of bungee cords to give the user the ability to personalize their experience with their product. So the red one, which you'll see later, had a K constant of 0.72 pounds inch, and the orange one had a spring constant of 0.79 pounds inch, and we did that using a ruler and a fishing scale, since bungees don't come with the K constant on them, sadly. So basically, we split our product into three different subsystems. Beginning with the base, we started initially by building a 1 to 10 scale prototype using popsicle sticks and glue just to confirm our sketches. From that, we modeled it in uh, SolidWorks and we uh, applied the desired material, which was pressure treated wood. We used two by fours and one four by four. And from that, we did a finite element analysis of the base, which you will see later. And from that, we decided to build the base in uh, real life, which is seen in figure 1C. So this is the design details of the launcher portion of the, the launcher subsystem. So first on the left, you can see our sketches. Well, we're still considering using tension, or tension springs uh, for the launching mechanism. Uh, and as you can see, we progress. We ended up using bungee cords. Uh, and also, we added uh, nylon bearings, which is seen there in the second slide. So like reduce the friction that's on the pivot point. Uh, initially, we were considering mounting the entire launching mechanism to the side of the 4x4, but we decided to mount it essentially around the 4x4, like you can see in figure 2C, to like equally distribute the forces around that 4x4. Um, and above the 4x4, you can see eye hooks there that were added so that the player that's practicing can change where the bungee cord is mounted, effectively changing the length and changing the force on the lacrosse stick. And for our latch subsystem, we began with uh, several different iterations of the design, beginning with uh, a hook that would be engaged into the launching system using a compression spring. But from that, we, uh, we prototyped and tested different uh, systems until we finally ended on a half-inch steel rod. As you can see in figure 3C, which uses a 90 degree angle at the top 
uh, to stop the launching mechanism from moving in the upward direction and is also connected to the foot pedal at the bottom using a metal wire. And so this is showing our finite element analysis of our base. So we applied a 20 pound force uh, to the top of the base. And as you can see, it did not, uh, the material did not yield. So we also decided to remove the fourth leg of our base because we found it advantageous to uh, lesser the weight of our total subsystem. So this is our completed SOLIDWORKS model of all the uh, subsystems integrated. Uh, things missing from this model are the eye hooks that are placed at three positions on the stick, and there's four sets of them, as you can see in the uh, picture located on the, was it 3C, um, on the launcher subsystem slides. Uh, so they were able to change, again, the length of the bungee cords to essentially change the speed of the launch. This is our budget breakdown. For wood base and wood ties, it's 2670. You can see that, I, I won't read through everything, um, but you can see that we're at 14 cents over budget. This doesn't include items that were purchased by the advisor and team. We were donated two lacrosse sticks to mess around with by, the, uh, by our faculty advisor. And our team purchased the foot pedal as well, just because we were close to getting to their $200 budget limit. So here's an overview of our semester's work. So in February, when this class started, we began research on what a women's lacrosse draw actually is. And then we began sketching prototype designs, as you can see in the photo below that. In March, we finalized our prototype, as you can see in the photo below, the one-tenth scale that we talked about earlier in the presentation, and began base analysis, including the FEA. And we brought that prototype to the women's lacrosse practice. In April, we constructed the base and finalized the launcher design. And then when we constructed the launcher, we began the system integration. As you can see in the photo below, that was when the whole base was constructed. And in May, we constructed the latch system and we began final testing and we still plan to continue our testing as the semester completes. As you can see on the left in figure 6A, that's our whole um, system all together with the foot pedal loaded with the bungee cords. So if a user wants to reuse it after you see in the video, they can just pull it back down. I want to press that video for you guys. And something also to mention, if you saw the prototype move a little, our advisor has been able to give us weights that he will put on the base in between those triangles to hold the prototype down. Thank you very much, and any questions? I do have a question. So, um, you did a pretty good job doing analysis, at least on your base. What about the launcher itself? Um, have you, did you do any analysis in terms of just determining, um, you know, what would be the output force on that arm just to get the ball hard before you wanted to get it? Um, what was the parameters there? Have you, did you do any analysis on that? So we have not conducted analysis other than testing the spring concepts of the bungee. A lot of the, I guess, analysis was done through testing. So adding one bungee, see how that reacts. Adding another bungee, see how that reacts. And from there, the motion is just going up. So the motion, that last slide that you saw, is what we need. It doesn't need to go, the ball doesn't fly up at a certain height. They just, the girls both have to fight for it and then whoever gets it, gets possession of it. If that makes sense. Did I answer your question fully? Yeah, but do you know what is, you know, what is being, like as is, right? Do you know what is the output force on that end in case, for example, you know, for whatever reason in the future you wanna know, okay, well you wanna tweak that how, how would you adjust the system to like maybe make it go farther or higher? Did you, you know? So we, in terms of launcher analysis, we did simple like bearing analysis uh, to make sure the launcher would hold. Uh, but in terms of increasing like launch speed and stuff like that, we have various methods that the user can mess around with in terms of 
bungee cords that are capable of shortening the length as well as adding separate bungee cords and also changing where the bungee cords attach. This picture is a little bit better to see, but you could move the bungee cords closer to it, changing the length, making it less spring constant or less force applied. Uh, so those would be the methods of doing that. And, and we haven't put like a number on uh, the value of force that would be applied, but we could calculate it fairly easily using the lever arm length as well as the bungee force. And that would be something we do for the future. So right now you, you, you kind of don't know, you know, what is, what is the force, what are the forces being applied on the various joints? So you have, of course, you have mounting at the top, you have uh, various joints where you're attaching the apparatus so you don't know what, you know, what is being applied on those, at those joints, what kind of force is being pulled on them. Is she uh, <laughs> okay. okay. Yeah, that is correct. That's something we have to look into. Um, our, we present it to faculty advisor and Prof G, I believe, next Wednesday. So I'm sure by next Wednesday we can iron some of that out. Are there any plans for redesigning the base to make it smaller? Because I know if the ball launches up to the right, the lacrosse player can't really get around that leg coming out. So my understanding is they can't cross the midfield line until after it's launched. And that was something we initially considered. We decided to take that first leg out to give them more room on like the launching side to move around. But I, I'm not too familiar with women's lacrosse rules. That's just my understanding of it. They can't cross the midfield line until after launch or guys' possession. So making it smaller would probably be a future design for the, pro for the prototype. So initially, I'm not familiar with women's lacrosse that much, and I apologize, but uh, it appears in the image to the left, the lacrosse stick is, you know, the, 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 the ball, whatever, could fall out of it. It's not upside, it's not right side where gravity would, you know, hold it. Yet you're still launching it in a vertical direction. Yeah. So my impression initially on the face off or whatever it's called, they were pushing against each other in a horizontal direction. However, you're launching in a vertical direction. I was curious, what, is that just the way it usually ends up being? So normally the ball goes in between the back of the sticks. So yeah, it's not going to stay in there because it's not in the pocket. And then when the two girls are pushing on it, they goes in the upward direction and the ball normally flies up and then they catch it and to possess it. Thank you so much. Congratulations on your final presentation. Very good. All right, last but not least, our final presentation is our final lacrosse. And they will be presenting on lacrosse face-off. <laughs> and actually, all of them are lacrosse players, yes? Yeah, all right, here. <laughs> um, good afternoon, everyone. We are Team Faux Robo. And my name's Dane Hall. Uh, I'm Ricky Fedorchek. And I'm Talon Campbell. Next. Uh, so our customer is also Mr. Kevin Gibbons, Gibbons O'Neill, who is the assistant athletic director here since 2005. And he was also a player here, so getting to work with him was a privilege for us as lacrosse players, like Prof G mentioned. Uh, so the primary objective of uh, our project was to, to design an automated face-off machine to, uh, like, for Fogo's on the team to play against because there's not many um, advanced enough options out there right now. Um, there's also sometimes that a teammate is not available, so like facing off with no opponent is not uh, very game realistic, so we are tasked with creating an automated machine that can be used for individual face-off players. After sitting down with Mr. O'Neill, the system requirements that we decided were most important were that the stick was able to create this clamping motion. So this, for a men's face-off, the stick is flat on the ground and then it moves forward and clamps over top of the ball. So that was obviously most important. Um, and the stick moves forward while this motion is occurring. Uh, we also needed the machine to be portable so that it could be brought from storage out to the field and vice versa. It needed to be powered by electricity so that 
it could function on its own. Um, and we needed to play down set followed by a whistle noise because that is how a, a uh, face off is actually initiated. Like that's what sets off the motion. So those are the requirements that we decided were most important. Um, for prototype one, we decided to go with a fully physical model. Um, we, were, we wanted to test and figure out if we could get this linear motion that also had rotational motion along with it. And we decided to try rack and pinions, which worked out for us. We uh, scroll sawed, cut the gears and uh, racks for the stick to go through. So after doing this, we did realize that although this wasn't quite advanced enough, it will give us the linear and rotational motion that we we're looking for. Uh, we moved on. Moving on to prototype two, we had to figure out a way to power our system. And we came to the idea of uh, chain and sprocket system because it allowed, a, allowed us to get ro rotary motion and linear motion. And so the, for the stick to turn and move linearly, you have to have some give in your actuation. So prototype two was very successful for us. We successfully achieved the uh, power system uh, combining with our rack and pinion. And we got a nice clamp motion emulated with um, solid forward motion and the clamp all simultaneously. And we even got the cadence done through our coding, which although it was just three beeps, from a coding standpoint, that is pretty much complete. And then our footprint was set. We've kept this almost the same through our final design. It was, um, even in this stage where it was much heavier with all the wood, it was portable and pretty small. And at this point, what we still needed, the biggest thing was speed and torque, because uh, in the face-off, the um, athlete applies a lot of force to the system and does it very quickly. So we need to get a motor that can keep up with that. And then we also need to continue f uh, condensing the footprint, so fitting all the components like the circuitry you see there, and then adding into the code the ability to vary the, diffi uh, the difficulty for, um, obviously, different athletes are going to have different skill levels. So you need to be able to change the time between the whistle and when the actuation takes place. So after prototype two, we found that um, the mechanical advantage is not so simple as just your drive sprocket to the uh, sprocket on the shaft. So with a little bit more pretty math, we found the real advantage. And what we needed to add was a three, three to one transmission to get the speed we need. So here you see some pretty CAD that shows what we added is a three to one transmission before the sprocket so that the linear velocity of our chain is as fast as we need it to be. And we also included a, a upgrade of the box, which is acrylic. Uh, after, the, after looking at the uh, upgraded torque, you, we all know as mechanical engineers that to get more speed, you're gonna have to sacrifice some torque, which meant upgrading our motor. So we ordered a motor that, was five, that had five times more torque than the motor we had in the previous stage. We implemented that three to one transmission I showed you. We upgraded to acrylic, as I showed you again in the CAD. And upgrading to acrylic also meant that our box was far more square, which was a lot better for our rack and pinion and reducing the, uh, the slippage. Uh, additionally, in this next stage, we downloaded the true cadence, which Dane mentions before, is down, set, and whistle, and not just three beeps. And another improvement we made was uh, making finer teeth in our rack and pinion so that the travel was nice and smooth and the motion was emulated <coughs> almost perfectly. Uh, this, what you're looking at here, is the result. The most notable thing in the image is the acrylic box, and you may be able to see the upgraded motor. Um, we successfully included uh, most of our upgrades, and things that we still need to work on are the speed and torque, which we've improved uh, even more since making this presentation, and then uh, chipping away at the weatherproofing and tidily including all components inside the box. All right, so as Talon had mentioned, uh, how do we turn all this physical hardware into an automated system? Well, we need a control system. So uh, we decided to go forward with Arduino as our, uh, as our code and our control system. Uh, we both, we, none, of, none of the members on our team really had experience with any, any of this, so this was a big learning curve for us. Uh, we initially were gonna use Raspberry Pi and uh, because of supply chain issues, quickly moved to Arduino. So here's the first part of the code. Um, most notably, at the bottom, you'll see these uh, long strings of numbers which continue off the screen. Um, this is the way we uh, took our audio file and we turned it into a string of numbers. And then uh, through that, we were able to hook up a speaker 
um, which would audibly play the words down set and then a whistle noise uh, that we recorded ourselves. Uh, this is just the setup of our code. Um, here's the meat of our code. So our system is signaled by a button. Uh, when this button is not pressed, if you see at the bottom in the else statement, a red light is going to be there, uh, signaling that the system is in standby mode. Uh, when the button state is high or the button is pressed, the green LED flips on showing that the sequence has started. Uh, it's going to give an, a nice setup period for the user to put the ball on the ground where it needs to be. Then the system will autoplay play down, set, with, uh, with a randomly generated time in between this so that the face-off person cannot uh, start, to time, start to adapt to the timing in their head and jump the whistle. And then additionally, we added a potentiometer as a difficulty adjustment for our Dif difficulty adjustment for our system. So if you turn, turn the potentiometer, the, uh, the time between the whistle and the system clamp, which is our reaction time, can be varied. So this is just how we wired the uh, LEDs, two of them. Next. Our potentiometer for that uh, variable reaction time, we're calling it. And then this is how we um, wired our servo with an external power supply. Go ahead. Um, and then this is our budget for the project, so it's, it's a bit high for what we would like, but we're not so much worried about that because the uh, intended uh, person that would be buying this would be a university, so, or a university's lacrosse team, so we feel that this budget is, is not terribly high, and there's also a lot of things on here that we used and then we upgraded from, so there is some extra cost used in that. Looking, looking ahead, we, like we said before, there's a couple things left to be done, which include the testing, uh, refining the housing, really getting the top and bottom enclosed, and then tidying up our circuitry and mounting the speaker on the system so that it's a, a nice, tidy-looking product and not a sort of raw prototype. Thank you. First off, I love the audio feedback. It's awesome. Um, but question I have is, how big is the box again? It's a 12 by 12 by 12. OK, so that's a lot bigger than I thought it was. Um, is there any way that you have it have any traction in the bottom so it's not sliding around a turf surface? Yeah. Uh, the idea is to put some studs in that work just like cleats. Or another option would be like the bottom of a cup. It's kind of only the outside is sitting on the bottom, which helps it level a little bit instead of having the full flat surface so that just the outside is grabbing onto the ground and not the full thing. And last thing is that it's operating on turf, so there's a little bit of digging into the ground that you can do when you set up the machine to assist the cleats. It won't be on a flat surface, or it won't be on a completely flat surface. Um, so my question again is just centered around the engineering analysis aspect of it. Uh, you know, just in terms of just the, the motors that you use and um, you mentioned, of course, you needed to increase your speed, you know, um, it would have been nice if you had displayed, you know, just uh, the thinking process and the calculations you made around that. Uh, I don't know if you can maybe just elaborate on that a little bit. I got you. So because our, our system is all timing based, our, the success of our system is based off how fast can we get a response out of our, our machine to compete with the reaction time of a human. Um, so this kind of takes the data we had from prototype two, um, and we, we literally took a video of the clamp speed for how long it took to go 90 degrees and, re and realized how far off we were, and we realized that we wanted to turn 90 degrees in 0 .06 seconds. But with the motor upgrade that we needed, we took the specs of the motor, which is 0 0.22 seconds for a 90 degree clamp, uh, added our advantage, that which included the transmission as well as the difference in sprocket size, um, from our drive sprocket to the sprocket that's actually uh, on, our, on our turning shaft, and uh, which gave us that 3.75 total advantage. So that's how it, we kind of came up with the matching uh, 0 0.06 for 90 degrees of turn. Okay, thanks. For Mr. O'Neill, do you have any comments? for all three of your last groups. Way impressed. Thank you very much. Thank you. Way impressed, he says. <laughs> Congratulations on your final presentation. But you're not done yet. So, all right, at this point, we, first off, let's give them all a round of applause. It was phenomenal. Really well done.
Our next part of this is going to be in our atri a excuse me, engineering atrium. Our judges will be going over there to look at all the different prototypes, although please know that they are not completely finished. They do have a couple more weeks and they do have their final demos. Otherwise, please give them a congratulations. This is a very tough course and uh, they did such amazing work. So congratulations to all of you. I will see you over there.